Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our online event, the Financial Markets Response to COVID-19 Policy Interventions, hosted here virtually by the Systemic Risk Center at the LSE and co-organized with the Bank of Canada. My name is JP Zigrant. I am a co-director at the Systemic Risk Center and of the Financial Markets Group here at the LSE. The SRC Systemic Risk Center was founded to study anything that puts the financial system at risk of not working properly. Financial markets first brushed off COVID-19 and then went into a state of panic, prompting central banks and sovereigns to step in with a rich set of policy interventions. The Twitter sphere and blogospheres have been busy shouting at each other about the merits or costs of the interventions with views ranging from supporting to indifferent to outright hysterical, heretic and conspiratorial. So we thought it was a good time now to start taking stock and look at the facts rigorously to see what worked, what didn't work and what should have been done. Given the subject, I'm honored that this event is co-organized with the Bank of Canada, the Canadian Central Bank. We have strong links with the bank as we have over time been successful in placing quite a few number of our outstanding SRC research alumni at the bank in light of the bank's outstanding research dedication and track record. Today, we have included four papers into our program and they will be presented by Andrew Greenland from Elon University, Daniel Greenwald from MIT, Gordon Liao from the Federal Reserve Board, and Andreas Uteman from the Bank of Canada, and previously a research uh, officer at the SRC and still a research associate at the SRC. Each author will be introduced by one of our session chairs. First, our capable research officer at the SRC, Mattia Bevilacqua, and our ex-SRC research officer, Lerby Ergen, now at the Bank of Canada and a research associate here at the SRC. If you are tweeting about our event, which I hope you will, and you want to share your thoughts, please use hashtag LSE COVID SRC. That's hashtag LSE COVID SRC. Uh, this online event is being recorded and also live streamed onto YouTube. So now my time to hand over to the session chair, Mattia, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, JP. Yeah, as you mentioned, we have a lot to cover today, so let's get it started right now. Uh, I'm Mattia Bevilacqua, as uh, JP mentioned, I'm a postdoc at the SRC at the LSE, and I will be chairing two sessions today, the first and the third. Our first speaker is Andrew Greenland from Elon University, where he's uh, assistant professor of economics. Um, just let me brief you on some of the logistics. So Andrew will, as any other speakers, present for 25, about 25 minutes, and then we'll have a, about 10 minute session of Q&A. Please hold all your questions for the end of the presentation. So we'll take all the questions at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, please use the raise hand feature in the participant uh, box of Zoom that usually is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, when you raise your hand, we will unmute you and give you the floor. Uh, we'll also kind you to state your name and affiliation, and if you can, uh, also switch your camera on to, um, let's try to make this event as interactive as possible. So without any further delay, I will hand over to Andrew. Andrew, the virtual floor is yours. You can, you can share your screen. All right, can everybody uh, see the screen and hear the mic? Great, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to uh, presenting this paper. This is uh, joint work with Anusha Chari, Laura Alfaro, and uh, Peter Schott. Um, and the paper we're working on is called Aggregate and Firm Level Stock Returns, Returns During Pandemics in Real Time. Now, one of the motivations for this paper is to try and get some insight on the divergent narratives between the labor and equity markets uh, and in terms of the information they're providing um, uh, bankers, economists, uh, lay people about the existing state of the economy. Now, we're going to be focusing on the U.S., uh, equity and labor markets here. But these are, are pretty familiar graphs to most of us at this point where we see 
a, a relatively stable uh, and growing stock market uh, through the beginning of March that rapidly declined and then almost miraculously rebounded at the same time we saw re record increases in uh, unemployment rates and jobless claims throughout the United States. And so one of the motivations of this paper is going to be to try and provide some insight on how these two markets are reacting um, and providing such different perspectives on what's happening in the economy. Now, empirically, this turns out to be a rather challenging approach with a standard asset pricing model, because as we think about quantifying the effects of uh, labor and equity markets at the same time, getting a clear picture of how equity markets are going to react in the face of these sort of rare events like um, a pandemic or any kind of other rare disaster uh, requires a, a leap of faith or, or a careful eye to, to modeling the actual um, evolution of the event itself. Um, and we might think that to be the case because any sort of pre-pandemic asset pricing model may be either misspecified if there's some new risk factor that has become apparent after the pandemic has started or misestimated, meaning that the factor loadings or, or our idea of how firms might be exposed to the uh, changes in the uh, system, systemic risk in the economy uh, may not reflect uh, the pandemic risk if there is no information on uh, pandemic risk prior to the actual uh, onset of the pandemic here. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to try and take a different approach to this um, asset pricing problem and think about directly modeling the information set available to investors um, in real time and focusing on the trajectory of the pandemic itself through unanticipated case growth as a means of quantifying the exposure of firms or aggregate indices to the actual uh, changes in the pandemic itself. Um, and, the, and, the, and the rationale behind this is we're going to be thinking about investor beliefs of regarding the total cost of the pandemic uh, via maybe a mortality channel or some underlying demand shocks or a supply chain channel uh, via disruptions, either international or domestic, or fiscal and monetary uh, policy interventions. We're going to be thinking about these as relying on the underlying state variable, um, which is gonna be informing a lot of policymakers' decisions, consumer behavior, or supply chain interruptions themselves being these COVID-19 cases. And so what we're going to be doing is exploiting the fact that the World Health Organization releases information about the COVID caseloads after trading hours in markets, which gives us a, an exogenous shock to the beliefs of investors about the trajectory of the pandemic that would then be priced in on the subsequent day. And so with this, we're gonna be able to get an idea of how the information set about the trajectory of the pandemic is evolving in real time and get some information about the unexpected component of case growth uh, and how that's actually going to map into returns before the market actually opens. So um, we'll then go ahead and take this measure of this evolving information set and quantify a firm level exposure to um, COVID. And then what we're going to do is try and validate this in two ways. The first is we're going to try and um, establish that it is a strong predictor of the cross section of returns, even accounting for the, the traditional asset pricing models. Um, we'll also validate our measure of exposure, exposure, our beta on the COVID unexpected case growth here against some of the already established channels of exposure that we know about in the literature already. Um, and then within the last two weeks here, we've also seen uh, a variety of vaccine announcements that have come out about more successful trials and, and quite high rates of efficacy among uh, potential COVID vaccines. And so what we're going to do is we're going to validate our measure of firm level exposure by looking at whether it is predictive of the reactions to the vaccine announcements uh, at the firm level. Now, once we've established that this beta is going to uh, relatively effectively capture the firm's exposure to COVID, we're going to then try and link this to the labor markets and look at both industry level changes of employment as a function of the industry level uh, exposure to COVID, as well as the spatial incidence of job losses in the US um, as reflected in our 
our COVID exposure measure. So our key findings here is that these after hours changes in case trajectory uh, do in fact quite well predict the next day's stock returns. Um, when we think about the magnitude here, an unanticipated doubling in case growth uh, is going to lead to a decline of between four and 8% in the Wilshire 5000 index, which is the closest thing the US has to a total uh, market cap index and vice versa. So unanticipated declines in the rate of case growth are also going to lead to increases in uh, the, the market reaction. So we think to some extent this, this information set change can help explain not only the rapid declines, but also the increases in the market uh, on, on a daily basis. In terms of the firm level exposure, what we'll observe is that roughly 96% of firms have uh, returns that negatively co-vary with changes in the disease trajectory, uh, meaning their, their beta will be negative here. So as unanticipated case growth soars, these firms have very negative returns, whereas a minority 4% of those firms are going to see uh, increases in their, in their value as the trajectory uh, increases as well. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll also see that our factor here explains well the cross-section of returns. It's robust to uh, inclusion of factor loadings in the pre-pandemic period from various factor models. And interestingly, uh, we've got uh, some rather new results here suggesting that this effect has started to dissipate following the vaccine announcements. That is, the, the effect of this COVID exposure seems to be um, reducing uh, following some positive news about uh, future uh, COVID um, limits due to the vaccine. In terms of the exposure and labor market implications, uh, we'll document a few channels of exposure here. Um, the, the biggest being that firm losses are smallest where their ability to discharge costs is the highest. So these are firms with low debt or labor intensive production or, in, or operating in sectors in which production interruptions are minimized via the ability to continue teleworking even as lockdowns um, may take hold. We'll also see demand exposure in that firms have the highest losses where social distancing is not possible. These would be uh, hospitality sectors, entertainment sectors and the like. As we look to the labor markets, the key takeaway we see here is it suggests that uh, investors are tending to penalize firms with uh, non-dischargeable costs, meaning the market cap falls the most for these firms, precisely because they are unable to shirk their costs as the pandemic causes the economy to collapse. Uh, to the contrary, very labor-intensive firms experience lower losses and quicker rebounds in their market value, precisely because, um, we believe, because the firms were able to cut some of their costs by firing labor's uh, firing labor rapidly. There are a plethora of papers on this uh, topic, and given that we only have 25 minutes, and um, many other authors are going to speak about this topic here today, I'm not going to discuss our our related work right now. So, in terms of an outline for the rest of the presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to talk very simply about how we're going to estimate these unanticipated increases in COVID infections during our pandemic. In the paper, we also validate this approach during the SARS pandemic um, in the mid 2000s. But today, of course, we're just gonna be focusing on COVID and in the context of the US. We'll also be then moving on to quantifying the effects on the aggregate market, as well as the firm level stock returns. We'll turn to validating our measure of firm exposure by establishing its robustness to the standard asset pricing models, as well as um, a, plus, a, a sort of external validity check against the vaccine announcements. And then we'll, of course, turn to the labor market dynamics. All right, we're going to be starting with a very simple framework here where we're going to be thinking about the market value of any firm at a moment in time as some firm specific function J of the expected case sequence of cases that'll be taking place from the in, initial period of the pandemic until it ends. Um, right now, we're going to keep this as some static 
function, but you could of course imagine as, as we're gonna hear later today about how some fiscal policy instruments and monetary policy instruments may make this a time varying function of the number of cases so that as cases continue to grow, monetary policy, for example, or fiscal policy may, um, may mitigate the economic consequences of that, of that case growth. But for right now, we're going to take a look at this as a static function of expected cases. Now, the way the model is going to unfold here is prior to trading at time T0, investors are just going to form a belief about the trajectory of the pandemic, given the case data that is available prior to market opening. And so that will be all of the cases from time zero up to time T minus one, right before the market opens. And they're just going to create an expectation about the value of the firm by forecasting the expected cases the, from the initial period all the way through the end of the pandemic, conditional on that information available at the start of uh, prior to trading. So then we can think about the return on the firm here as the percent change in market value, the log change in market value relative to the market close. Now, when the market closed last, the forecasts were being made on information that was only available prior to that day's trading. And so the change in those two forecasts is going to give us a sort of summary statistic for the unanticipated shift in expectations. Now, rather than focusing on the full change in forecasts across the entire time period, we're going to start with a very simple uh, measure, which is just going to be quantifying the expected forecast when trading starts, given the information available that was released overnight since the market was last open as compared to when the market was open last. Okay, and so we're just going to look at these three objects. This first one in blue here is the predicted number of cases at time T0 when trading commences, given the information available before the market opens at T minus one. We're gonna look at the same forecast for the today at T0, given the information available yesterday, and we're going to take a look at the log change in that series. So this is just the percent change in the unexpected case growth, uh, how much of a surprise there was about the numbers that were released overnight about the number of cases that manifest uh, in, here, here in the U.S. And then what we're going to do is we're going to relate that measure of firm exposure, or excuse me, uh, relate uh, either an index return or a firm's stock returns on any day to this change in daily uh, unexpected case growth. So we're gonna have a time series of unexpected case shocks from the beginning of the pandemic, um, and we'll run it through the end of April. And we're gonna relate that to these uh, daily stock returns, both at the aggregate and at the firm level. All right. So in order to actually forecast these um, unexpected case growths, uh, what we're going to need to do is take a stand on a formal model for how to forecast this. By now, uh, the economics profession is rife with uh, SEER models sitting all over the place, as well as uh, other types of forecasting models to think about quantifying a variety of interventions in, in the economy that might have either macroeconomic consequences or, or the ability to limit the spread of the pandemic directly. But one of the challenges with these SEER models is they may require um, information about uh, key parameters uh, and, and vectors of transmission for the disease that may not be known at the time of trading, particularly early on in the pandemic. And so what we're going to use here instead of a more complicated SEER model is just a very simple exponential uh, growth model, which very well approximates um, these SEER models in the initial stages of the pandemic, as well as a logistic model, which is um, an equilibrium solution for a simple SEER model in which reinfection is possible, uh, because both of these can be estimated before the true model is known and only require information on the cumulative number of cases. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to create this set of forecasts for each day's, um, each day's cases and the future trajectory conditional on the information sets available at different points in time, okay? So as I've said before, we're just gonna use a logistic outbreak. Everybody has seen these uh, cumulative and daily case curves before. Um, and in the paper, we'll show that, you know, even approximating this with an exponential on these day-to-day -day case forecasts uh, captures the shape of these curves very well. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to turn 
to thinking about the effects of COVID uh, in the United States here. So what I've got here for us is the case forecast that we're going to be presenting at uh, five different moments in time. So what you'll see on the left-hand side, this is the level scale, and this is just the uh, real case growth will be, re the reported cases will be here in this uh, black bolded line. Uh, in red, we'll see our first case forecast that I'll be presenting right now in March, uh, conditional on the information available up until March 7th, we would have expected the case trajectory to follow this red cone outward, uh, which stays relatively low. By March 13th, there was a lot more unexpected case growth, which shifted these projections up much higher. By March 21st, it had gone even higher yet. But then in March 28th, the case growth was slower than anticipated. And we can see that the projections here, in fact, do dip back down. And so what that's going to give us here are these unexpected positive as well as negative shocks. And, and perhaps it's easier to see this over here in the log scale. Um, it seems funny now to be thinking about this as, as having predicted cases here in the hundreds of thousands as opposed to the millions, but that's of course where we were when this, uh, this whole project started. And again, you'll see this black line is going to give you the realized cases. The red is going to provide us information about uh, cases uh, projected on March 7th, and each one of these days provides some additional information uh, about that day's future forecasts. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to provide for you these uh, blue and red lines. Uh, the blue line is again, the cases I would have predicted at any moment in time T, given the information I had two days ago. And in red, it's given the information I had yesterday or right before the market opens. And so the, we can watch those series trace out over time and the observed cases are actually reported there in gray. And then our measure of this information change here in green is going to be the unexpected case growth. And that ends up being here on our right-hand axis. And so what we can see here is early on in the pandemic, this, given the initial number of cases that came uh, off of um, uh, the initial data, each day had relatively lower growth than we would have expected given the day before until we get to about the end of February when unexpected case growth spikes. And so we can watch this series move around, and this is going to be our way of getting exogenous variation in the expectations about the trajectory of the pandemic uh, to identify the effect on the aggregate index as well as the firms. And so what I'm going to do briefly is I'm just going to show you what this would have looked like in real time so that what we can see is the evolution of this series and how well it actually tracks with the market. So in the top, what you'll see is uh, information on the forecast, okay? So um, in red, we'll actually see the number of COVID-19 cases with the forecast uh, um, um, bandwidth around it. In the dotted line, we'll see how that changed relative to the day's prior forecast. So on February 12th, the COVID no number of COVID cases was about 5.5% lower than we would have expected given the prior day's information. The bottom graph is then going to relate that to the level of the Wilshire 5000 index. Again, this is going to be our measure of our, the total impact on the US economy here, as this is the closest we have to a total market index. And so what we'll see is as these case, cases start to climb, this is the moment where we see this rapid dip in the uh, Wilshire 5000. Again, this is not the number of realized cases. This is the unexpected case growth that is revealed. As they both uh, move in opposite directions here. Again, this is consistent even as the case, the unexpected case growth falls, we see modest recoveries in the Wilshire 5000. And this pattern will continue until we see much more active Fed involvement here on uh, about March 18th, which we'll hear more about um, later today, uh, where the effect of this case growth information uh, starts to flatten out. Um, more formally, what we're going to do is we'll just regress this uh, log change in our index on the log change in unexpected case growth here. Um, and I'll show you a scatter plot that's going to capture this information for us. But roughly what we're going to see is this pattern in which the periods where there are higher unanticipated case growth, like on March 9th, we see larger declines in the market value. And conversely, say on March 24th, up here in the 
top left-hand side of our screen, we can see unanticipated reductions in case growth and increases in the market value uh, at the same time. So generally, this is the pattern that we're going to observe throughout our full uh, period here. Now, we will formally try and control for some additional uh, controls here, including monetary policy announcements and fiscal policy announcements. Uh, and while those do have a significant impact on returns, none of them have a primary impact on our measure of informational changes and how those are actually reflected in the market. So we'll return to this in a little bit as we think about the efficacy of some of these various policy interventions. Uh, it is worth noting that when we actually do control for same day monetary and fiscal policy, we do see a mitigation in the effect of the uh, news shock on the change in the opening value or the closing value, suggesting that the news of some monetary policy action may, may be dampening fears about the, the, uh, the unexpected case growth. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna to turn to identifying how we can quantify firm level exposure and look at validation with this same information shock. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the firm level stock returns as a function of our um, unexpected case growth on each day, this log change in case forecast from yesterday to today. Uh, and then we can also, of course, control for some of the more uh, common factor models here. We've run this with the standard market model, a strict version of a CAPM, the Fama French uh, three and five factor models. Um, we think of these as kind of an over control because we think we're modeling the underlying state variable here, which is going to shock those, those portfolios directly. And so um, what I'll be presenting is, is I think an over control of this, but for conservatism, I'll be reporting what these firm level exposures look like while, when using, for example, the, the on the French three factor model as our set of controls. So what we can see here is this is our measure of firm level exposure. Um, for each one of our firms, we're going to run this um, returns regression against this unexpected case growth, as well as our factor, uh, excuse me, our, our Fama French portfolios. We're going to recover those betas, and we're going to be focusing primarily here on this beta COVID. And the vast majority of firms in our sample have a negative exposure, meaning that as unexpected case growth increases, these firm returns are negative, okay? And vice versa for the remaining four to six percent of firms, as case, case growth goes up, that small set of firms see increases in the value of, um, of their firm. Just as a simple validation check here, first what we're going to be doing is, is a um, regression to quantify the impact of our, our, our factor on the cross section of firm level returns. And so again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna regress the daily returns on our factor loadings, our COVID-19 factor, the Fama French factors, and we're gonna recover these coefficients that are gonna provide us information on, on how much the, this cross-sectional exposure to COVID is impacting firm level returns. Now, as I mentioned before, what we're going to see is that the, our measure of COVID exposure does a pretty good job of, of, quantify, uh, of explaining the cross-section of returns here. Um, and we do see a reduction in the importance of this COVID exposure surrounding some of the larger moves that uh, the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve started making in markets starting in late uh, March here that takes down some of the uh, explanatory power of this uh, COVID uh, factor in, in explaining the cross-section of returns. As a measure, uh, as an attempt at getting some external validity here, this is um, brand, brand new. Um, we scraped some financial market data uh, two days ago to try and get some information on equity market reactions to uh, the COVID vaccine announcements. And so what we're gonna be doing is the same kind of regression here where we're gonna run the regression of the firm level returns on our measure of exposure, as well as the pre-period factor loadings. And this will be happening just on uh, November 9th. So you can think of this as an event study approach where we're thinking about quantifying just the impact of this inform, uh, information release on the firms. And what we'll see here is that our measure of COVID, our COVID exposure is negatively related to our returns. Now, the way to think about this is remembering that our beta is in fact negative for firms that are, are exposed 
in a bad way to COVID, if their cash flows or, or, or um, risk profile is particularly susceptible to negative COVID shocks. What this suggests is that the news of the vaccine announcement is going to manifest positively for these firms. So that since the vast majority of these firms have negative returns, uh, excuse me, negative exposure to COVID, uh, this coefficient suggests that those firms are seeing substantial positive returns uh, on the day of these uh, vaccine announcements, which would be uh, November 9th. We're going to similarly do the, we'll, we'll do the same kind of setup here with, an, uh, with a difference in different specifications so that we could be mindful of, of any pre-trends that might be in the middle of this that could, that could of course, uh, contaminate our event window. And so what we'll be doing here is just running a very, very flexible difference in different specification where we'll be using the firm's factor loadings as well as their COVID exposure interacted with daily time dummy variables, as well as including time, time dummies and firm fixed effects. So that what we should be getting here is just the time varying element of the COVID exposure on firm returns, okay? Now, while there is some non-zero action in the pre-period, from October 2nd through October 8th, the average return over this period on our COVID factor relative to the, to the 8th is, is, is nil. Um, and then on October 9th, when we see the Pfizer and BioNTech uh, vaccine announcement, we see a reduction in the predictive capacity of our COVID beta on the cross-section of returns. Similarly here with the Moderna announcement on November 16th. So we think that this beta is doing a, a pretty good job of capturing the cross-section of firm exposures. And so what we're going to do now is take a look at some of those channels of sectoral uh, and cross-sectional exposure here. Um, what I wanna do for right now is just draw your attention to the right-hand panel here, where what we're going to be doing is, is taking a look at the average beta of one of these firms by sector. And what we'll see here is that there are particular sectors that respond very negatively uh, to the announcement of these unexpected COVID surprises. Uh, and we can take a look at their average daily return over this period too. So on the bottom left-hand corner, we see mining in the far left, suggesting that they are particularly harmed by these announcements of, um, of COVID surprises. And one thing to notice here is while some of these might have an intuitive interpretation regarding what we would now expose think of as social distancing measures like accommodation or entertainment, things where people are not going to be sitting outside, the natural intuition on things like construction and mining is not, is not really something we would think of as being driven by some sort of social distancing effect here. And so this is actually going to motivate uh, our, our idea that the cost dischargeability may be one of the big driving factors for quantifying the cross-sectional exposure to COVID. So what we'll end up doing here is running a series of firm level regressions using their estimated beta on some pre-pandemic attributes, including the total assets, um, employment, operating profit, cash, debt, as well as teleworkability. And while I won't have an opportunity to go through all of the results right now, they're of course fully in the paper and I'm happy to discuss them later, but Generally speaking, what we observe is that our firms are more exposed. The more PP and E they have, the greater uh, the number of assets that they have. They are less exposed, the more profitable they are, and the more employment they have, holding constant property, plant, and equipment. And so what that suggests to us is that there is some cost to being capital intensive and large during the pandemic here um, that, uh, that, that investors are reacting to. And so most of this is driven by uh, cross industry differences. When we look within industries, this penalty for capital intensity um, disappears. So our hypothesis on why this is a primary mechanism of exposure during COVID is that in, in the face of this economic, the anticipated economic contraction that comes with the, with the pandemic more generally, we, we believe that investors are recognizing that some firms are more well suited to be able to shed their costs in the face of a demand disruption, uh, whereas capital intensive firms are not going to be able to discharge these. That would be like our previous example here while we were looking at mining and petroleum. Um, it's, it's very hard to piecemeal apart a mining rig. Um, it, you've already sunk the costs, you're stuck paying for it 
you, you may have debt on it and, and are, are going to be unable to discharge those costs in the face of the, the economic, coming economic contraction. So while we don't actually have firm level employment data at this point, um, what we're gonna try and do is get at this question by looking at jobless claims spatially in the US as a function of these firm level betas. And we're gonna take a look at industry level employment and try and see if the information we get out of the labor market can be rationalized with this cost shedding channel via their impact on, um, on, on the firm's returns. So what we're going to be looking here um, for uh, how to quantify this is, is a set of two predictions. The first is that if we think about this capital intensivity as a means of, of limiting the, the firm's ability to shed costs, we would expect to see um, uh, ca more capital intensive sectors shed fewer workers as the pandemic begins. And then we should also see that regions that intensively um, employ people in these uh, capital intensive sectors ought to see both fewer jobless claims as we're gonna show that these industries tend to retain their workers but they should be employed in sectors that exhibit larger drops in market value. And so we're going to take- Andrew, if we can get to the conclusion, so we leave a bit of time for questions. Perfect, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, skip right, right through these then. then. Um, in, in short, what we're going to see here is that both of these uh, pr predictions are, do in fact hold. We see, see that capital intensive uh, sectors uh, see lower, increase in job uh, uh, unemployment, uh, uh, they, they retain their workers more. And spatially, what we observe is that sectors, um, states see lower uh, increases in jobless claims um, for these same capital in, in, in intensive sectors. So for example, uh, Wyoming saw enormous declines in market value during this period. Their primary a, a mining petroleum region uh, while, while we observed less declines in uh, employment, we saw larger declines in market value in those sectors. All right, so the conclusion here is just that um, we've tried to put together a means of quantifying firm and aggregate exposure to the pandemic via the information revelation that takes place outside of trading hours, leading to updated expectations about the trajectory of the pandemic. Sorry if I went over, thank you for the time. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. So we can now op open the floor for questions. So you can use your the race race and feature in the participant box, and we we'll, we will unmute you. Yeah. Orkun. Hello, hi, Andrew. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I was wondering just about your shock, the the forecasting uh, that you're using. Um, it only depends on the on the accumulated number of cases within U.S., right? Up until the point that you make the forecast. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes to me as a bit of, as a bit of a you know simplistic assumption and simplistic method of forecasting it because there was all, also a lot of cross country learning, to, especially in the beginning of the of the of the epidemic, right? Like people were looking at those countries that were you know kind of you know that got the virus earlier on and kind of trying to figure out like, you know, which country are we close to? Like, are we gonna evolve like China? Are we gonna evolve like Italy or, you know, Sweden? Uh, so I was wondering if you could use something where you could benefit from that kind of cross-sectional variation. And of course, uh, it's gonna be a bit of a self-marketing thing. Um, I have a paper early on um, in April, I think it's on the Systemic Risk Center website where I use forca uh, uh, synthetic forecasting methods. Uh, so you, you must be familiar with the synthetic uh, control methods. I kind yeah. of like adjust it in a way that, you know, that uses the information uh, from the earlier countries and then make a forecast for the countries that are kind of lagging behind. And that could probably, you know, that could prove a more sophisticated way of uh, getting that. I, I think that's a really great idea. I'll, I'll sit down and, and carefully take a look at that. It's something we've, we've thought about um, a bit. The, the one thing we've been kind of struggling with is trying to think about how heterogeneous the policy interventions are across the countries. And so uh, it's, it's certainly a simplified view to, to think of the US as an isolated uh, um, situation there. Um, 
but but I, your, your point is very well taken. I think there's a lot of benefits, particularly in thinking about calibrating a SEER model where we can get insights from the other countries and, and, and feed it into a more sophisticated model. Thank you very much. Mm, Andreas, it's a question. You can unmute yourself. Good. Um, just in terms of understanding exposure. So, um, I mean, you focus on the employment channel, but um, especially if you look at the results for, for mining, uh, did you look at sort of leverage or to what extent these firms are exposed to short term debt, especially as you mentioned that once the Fed step in the end of March, your effects become, or exposures become weaker, which would be a very natural kind of leverage channel uh, uh, to explain, explain this. Yeah, you're, you're certainly correct. The, um, in those firm level regressions, we also do control for uh, leverage, which, which as you would expect um, is, is um, positively correlated with exposure. So in this case, it's negatively correlated with, uh, with our beta. The, the more lev uh, highly leveraged the firm is, the more exposed they are to these kind of shocks. And it might be really interesting in that time series to get at the Fed channel directly to maybe interact that um, that that component of exposure with with a, a mon uh, excuse me a monetary policy um, measure to get at that channel more directly. That's a great idea. Okay, JP. I, I I think I had the same question as Orkun just now because the amazing thing was that for a long time cases across the world rose, but markets completely brushed it off. And it seems as you showed that it was really the US cases rising that created all of the mayhem in the markets, including in the European markets, where cases have been rising for a long time, but nobody uh, really thought very much of them. So I, th I think if you repeated this in other countries, you may not quite find the same. And, and there is something interesting about the UK markets, the, the US markets cre making us aware of our own problems. I mean, it's, it's sort of the timing is, is very interesting. And I wonder what you thought about that a bit more. So we, we have tried to do this um, in a couple of different markets. The, the one caveat that, that becomes a bit more challenging is the, um, it, it's, some, it's something that, that, that struck me very much today as I was trying to figure out precisely what time our, our seminar started today, right? So I'm on Eastern Standard Time. And so I, I got online about two or three hours early just in case I had, I, had, I had missed the time. I didn't want to be late. But that kind of information release issue where it happens overnight for US markets, the timing isn't as clean for the other markets. And so that, that makes that um, no arbitrage condition that we're using kind of for identification here um, a little bit less reliable, I think, in, in some of the European markets where that information is going to be out during active trade of, trading hours. Um, but but um, it, it, with, with the Milan exchange, for example, uh, we, we, we do um, see some similar kind of behavior. It's just, uh, it's something we should probably put a little bit more emphasis on. And if we did this in this multi-country setting, we could more directly control for central government actions uh, and central bank, uh, central bank actions as well. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Mm, Andreas, you have another question? You have another question. I mean, that's, that also goes back to the, the, the case of uh, surprises. I mean, to what extent do the models you use really uh, can capture things, phenomena like second waves, third waves, uh, because that's sort of really maybe the big, big hits that come in. And I, I wonder, I mean, I guess you can't do this, but exercises that work on sort of the equity term structure, like dividends, might potentially sort of like tell you something about that. But that's obviously at the firm level, it's probably something that is almost impossible to get in terms of data. But I'm just wondering to what extent, you know, you capture innovations about, about such really dramatic things that happen very in very distant future. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really great question. Um, you know, the the... I think the clean answer to that is by the time you get into concerns about second waves and what's been happening in the fall, um, you have enough information to have come up with a cleanly calibrated SEER model. And so that might be the more appropriate approach for thinking about quantifying what is unexpected in that context. Um, we, th we think it's reasonable um, to not, I mean, when we were trying to write this in, in March, um, you know, we talked to a variety of epidemiologists who were just pointing us towards like, well, these could be the vectors of transmission and here are the mechanisms and we don't really know. And so, you know, we took a more agnostic, um, almost curve fitting approach to, to quantifying the trajectory rather than a more structural SEER model. But, but um, I think for, for the latter waves, I think it would be really interesting to see if that sort of unexpected reaction is, is perhaps mitigated more now that we know that the, the central banks are going to be very active in trying to limit the, 
the economic fallout and, and particularly contagion through the financial sector and across countries. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I think we, we finished the time for this session. So I will actually now hand over to Labby, who will chair the second session. Thank, thank you all very for much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be chairing the second session. I'm a senior economist at the Bank of Canada and we're also concerned with what happened during COVID and the financial crisis. Uh, our second presentation will be by uh, Daniel Greenwald from MIT. Uh, he's an assistant professor in finance there and most of his research of what I can see has been on the intersection between finance and uh, macroeconomics. He'll talk today about the, uh, the early onset behavior in financial markets um, so Daniel will have approximately 25 minutes, uh, try to keep your, uh, questions to the end of the presentations where I'll unmute you if you have to, uh, have any questions, uh, just like this session. Um, yeah, so, uh, try to keep the question short and try to, um, get your camera on when the, when, when you ask a question so we could get some, uh, some feed with that as well. Uh, well, Daniel, the floor is yours for 25 minutes or 30, if you like, and uh, go ahead. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to present today. Um, this is joint work with uh, Josue Cox, who's on the job market, if anyone's hiring, and uh, with Sydney Ludvigson. And I think this is going to uh, follow up really nicely on the previous paper, which was super interesting. Um, because we're going to look at not like what happened in the sense of like, how did COVID move the stock market? Well, we will, but we're not going to look at just the amount that COVID moved the stock market. We're going to try to break down like why, through what channel. Um, and so that's that's kind of the motivation for our paper, what explains the, the COVID-19 stock market. So of course, it kind of goes without saying in this uh, <laughs> this event that, that COVID-19 caused major disruptions around the globe. And in particular, it hit the U.S. economy very hard between February and April of uh, 2020. And this showed up in a number of places, but among them very strongly, the stock market, uh, which lost more than a third of its value in just over a month between February 19th and March 23rd of 2020. Uh, but then actually almost just as quickly uh, regained uh, basically almost all of that value, uh, returning basically back to where it was in the previous year by April 17th of, of that year. And so in this paper, we're gonna ask what forces explain this uh, very sharp V-shaped trajectory for the value of the market? Uh, was it fundamentals like cash flows? And you know, in particular, we saw a sort of a unprecedented drop, a one quarter drop in output. Uh, we also know that profit uh, shares can change over recessions, which we actually saw showing up in the data as well. Um, what role did sort of the Fed cutting interest rates play uh, and potentially in the recovery? And uh, what was actually non-fundamental in some sense, just attributable to change in, in uh, the willingness of the market to tolerate risk over this period? And so of course, we probably all of these uh, had a role over the COVID-19 episode. And so what we're gonna try to bring to the table in this paper is uh, using a model to formally decompose these different forces. So the question that we'll ask in the paper is what primitive forces drove the stock market over the first quarter of 2020? And to address this, we're gonna combine a structural model that's gonna capture all of the key forces that I identified with an empirical event study to try to dig a little bit deeper into the role of uh, Fed policy. On the model side, we're gonna uh, actually adapt a model that we used in a different paper called How the Wealth Was Won uh, with Martin Letow and, and Sydney again. Um, and this model is actually able to sort of uh, capture period by period, uh, estimate in fact, the impact of changes in output, profit shares, risk-free rates and risk tolerance on the value of the market. So it's actually very well suited to this decomposition exercise, although we'll have to adapt it a little bit. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to, the event study side is going to estimate the effect of, uh, of basically Federal Reserve announcements empirically. And so what do we find? Um, it actually doesn't look, to our model at least, like the fundamentals, uh, meaning cash flows and risk-free rates, did much at all. So the declines in outputs and profit shares are basically uh, not able to explain the market crash if you're willing to use uh, sort of plausible shock sizes and persistences, according to the model. Um, and actually, while short rates are falling, which could have some stimula uh, stimulating effect, we find that actually this drop is also basically explained to, uh, uh, unable to explain more than just a tiny amount of the market recovery. And so instead, the model is going to conclude, for reasons that I'll kind of show you, that um, it really looks like changes in the market's ability to tolerate risk that are responsible for this uh, very rapid change. So you can think about just changes in, in discount rates. <clears throat> 
Uh, and in particular, you know, as, as you know, there's a lot of policymakers here today, we might be interested in, in to what degree policy had a role in sort of uh, influencing um, this change in risk tolerance, especially over the recovery. We find there actually was kind of a, a non-trivial uh, impact. So if you look at uh, announcements uh, um, of unconventional Fed policy, uh, they don't all go in this direction, but we find that, you know, you could optimistically say that they're associated with somewhere between a 7 and 12% rise in, in market values. Although it certainly depends on, on which exact program is being announced. So because uh, it's not a very long talk, I'm just going to jump right into the structural model we'll be using. And then uh, I'll show you what that implies for, for the COVID episode uh, after some background. And then we'll go to the empirics of the event study. OK, so um, the model is going to uh, basically be a production-based asset pricing model, although a very simple production side. Uh, production is going to be Cobb-Douglas in the model, um, where the TFP process, A, is going to be a random walk-in logs. And this is actually going to be the only stochastic part of output, because the other factors are just going to grow along a balanced growth path for capital and for the efficiency units of labor. They're just going to grow deterministically at rate G. Now the thing that was really new uh, when we published, or when, sorry, when we put out the other paper, is the role of factor shares here. Um, and in particular, we're going to assume that after this output is produced, the stockholders who own it only get access to share S of output that actually accrues to the shareholder as earnings, uh, so that E is equal to S times Y, where the remaining share is paid to other factors of production. Uh, or just other factors in general, like labor compensation, taxes, interest paid to debt holders, etc. OK, um, and then finally, we need to say a little bit something about investment. And basically, the, the idea is along a balanced growth path. Uh, actually, the, the shareholder doesn't get to consume all of this S share of output, because some of it needs to be reinvested to, to sort of um, uh, attain the growth in K deterministically. And so what we assume is that you, the, the shareholder always reinvests a fraction omega of corporate output, which is what happens along a balanced growth path, which is a constant fraction. And the remaining uh, earnings after reinvestment, which we call cash flow C, are paid out and consumed by shareholders. And so, of course, if you just do some algebra, it's equal to the earnings share net of this reinvestment share times output. Okay, uh, Our model is going to be uh, log linear, which is going to help us a lot. So we log linearize this. Um, and the main thing I'll, I'll say, which is not so relevant for this paper, but actually is really important over the longer sample, is that you actually end up with this very strong operating leverage effect, because uh, since about 12% of output goes to after-tax profits on average, but about 6% has to be reinvested. Uh, the proportional change in um, cash flows is on average about double the change in, um, in earnings because going from 12 to 11 is only half as large in effect as going from uh, six to five, basically. So um, that's what's going on kind of on the cash flow side. So now let's talk about the other part, which is kind of a uh, sentiment or risk tolerance. So of course that's related to preferences. And the way that we model preferences is that we uh, choose kind of a log affine stochastic discount factor, which is super tractable, uh, but I think also rich enough to capture a number of forces we're interested in. So what we're gonna do is write down this stochastic discount factor. It looks a lot like a power utility, CRA, with two exceptions, that it has a time varying kind of patience, meaning time discount factor here, and also a time varying risk aversion X, okay? So for the time varying, uh, discount factor, at least the time discount factor, uh, beta, we're going to do the standard thing that's used in these uh, log affine SDF models and just assume that this thing takes on whatever value it needs to be so that we kind of hit the risk-free rate process delta t at all times. So basically, what we're just going to have a, a stochastic risk-free rate, and the SDF is going to be kind of reverse engineered to make sure that we always hit that target. On the risk price, uh, basically, we're going to have this mostly be stochastic. We do have some loading on the earnings component itself, which is not going to be important for what I'll show you today. It's slightly important, but not that important for the uh, broader sample. And that's basically to make sure the model is actually able to, to actually capture the fact that profit shares actually co-move positively with the price to earnings ratio. Uh, if you didn't have this loading, uh, it would always be negatively correlated. So the data prefers it. It's not very important for, for these results today. OK, so now we're going to parameterize the model. And in particular, uh, you know, because the stock market is forward looking, it's going to depend a lot on the persistence of each shock. And actually, it really helps a lot because um, these processes all tend to have variation at different frequencies to give them a little more flexibility by having each state variable, meaning the, uh, the earnings share, the um, risk free rate, and the risk aversion, 
um, have both a low frequency and a high frequency component. In particular, the low frequency component is going to be much more important for asset prices. And this allows the model to kind of separately identify these while also capturing any high frequency variation that's going on in the broader process. Okay. And each of these is going to be uh, an independent Gaussian AR1 with mean zero. And that's going to give us a very uh, easy to work with state space for our estimation. OK, so then we solve the model, basically. And uh, because we have this nice log affine SDF, and we've made a couple of other uh, log linear approximations in various places, we're actually able to solve this model in closed form. So it's very, very tractable. In fact, it's tractable enough that we can estimate it directly on the time series, uh, taking kind of millions and millions of uh, MCMC draws. And so when we estimate this, we're going to uh, combine it with observable series that are going to help to pin down um, our various fundamental factors. We're going to have um, corporate output growth that's going to pin down uh, what's going on with productivity. We're going to have uh, movements in the corporate earnings share, and we're going to have movements in the risk-free rate, which are going to pin down these fundamentals as well. And then to make sure that we're able to explain 100% of variation in equity markets, we're also going to force the model to match period by period, uh, basically the value of corporate equity. In addition, we're also going to uh, add some more discipline to the model by making sure that the model is able to capture the risk premium that's implied uh, from options data as in Ian Martin's uh, QGE paper. So we're going to estimate the model. Uh, and that means that basically uh, in, in that paper, we're going to be able to account for both um, latent state and parameter uncertainty. So for background, before we get into the COVID episode, let me show you what these fundamentals are doing uh, in that paper over the broader sample. And in particular, the main result there is that actually fundamentals are doing a lot of lifting over the main sample. So you can see here in black, this is the ratio in the data uh, of market equity relative to output, okay? Um, and you can see it kind of drops and undergoes this enormous rise really since 1980 um, in this valuation ratio. And we can see that actually the red line here with its blue bands around it is the contribution just of the factor shares, uh, meaning the changes in, in the share of output that actually goes to the owners of the firm as after-tax profit. And basically it explains a lot of this slow moving trend in particular explaining actually more than half of the rise in this valuation ratio since 1989 where it's undergoing really explosive growth. So the main finding there is actually that uh, these profit shares in particular when we, when we dig deeper, it looks like movements in the labor share are really responsible for much of the rise over the last three decades in market valuations. Um, now next we kind of have this uh, change in just the orthogonal risk price. You can think of this just like pure kind of risk aversion moving around. It captures, this is the same underlying ratio in black, and it's actually capturing the high frequency pattern. So all the wiggles in the kind of data series are captured by, um, by this change in, this kind of secular change in risk aversion, although it is missing a lot of these lower frequency trends. And finally, uh, we find uh, maybe a little bit controversially, the changes in risk-free rates have a very small impact at all horizons. Uh, there's a very simple reason for this. You can see here the impact of risk-free rates on this ratio uh, is super small. Basically the model, really estimates and is pretty confident in assigning a pretty low persistence to movements in the risk-free rate, uh, which is about 0.93 quarterly. Uh, this is the real risk-free rate. Of course, the nominal one is much more persistent, but we think because of inflation is very persistent, but we think the real one is probably what should matter here. And that actually really weakens, weakens the effect of, of this variable because basically because stocks are so forward-looking, anything that's just, uh, not really, really persistent is just gonna be dampened a lot in its, its magnitude. Okay, so now that we've gone through um, all of that backstory, let's go into what this model says about the COVID-19 episode, and in particular, the role of these fundamental factors. So the first candidate, we're gonna look at the shock to output. I think it's a natural place to start because we saw kind of a really, uh, you know, what I would think it was really shocking uh, drop in output in 2020 Q2, which is on the order of about 10%, or you may have seen, you know, 30 something percent uh, annualized. Um, actually, it turns out the, the model as is was not a great uh, fit for this because, you know, I think there's good reason to think this was a transitory shock as opposed to the random walk uh, productivity processes of the model. So we augmented the model to give it a transitory productivity shock as well as the um, random walk. Um, and just to, so it's kind of clear what the what I'm going to be doing in this exercise, if I just sort of estimate the model and plug it in, I'll give you the preview. It's going to attribute everything to, to risk aversion, basically. Um, but that might not be totally satisfactory because there's a lot of reasons why we think the COVID episode might be different from what the models estimated in the past. So instead of what we're going to do uh, is really take um, the model and try to use it to bound the effect of the fundamentals, sort of make a bunch of conservative assumptions, kind of show you some various parameterizations so you can judge for yourself what the possible impact is and try to convince you that 
basically under any kind of reasonable specification, even when accounting for the special uh, nature of COVID, you're not gonna be able to explain very much just with the fundamentals, okay? So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna start with uh, this augmented uh, model with a transitory productivity shock. And then we're gonna use, um, we need to size the shock. We're gonna use the forecasted 2020 Q2 uh, drop in, in GDP for the magnitude of the shock forecasted by the survey of professional forecasters. Now, of course, it's just a forecast, but it turns out that the data came in almost exactly the same. So if you redid this with the true data, uh, which we didn't have at the time we, we wrote the paper, you'd find basically the same exact thing. So now what I've done here, is uh, plotted out what the impact would be of that size shock under different persistences of that output shock. And this is really important because again, you know, stocks give you a claim on um, firm dividends forever. So uh, they're very forward looking and the impact, you know, transitory shocks really are gonna have only a limited impact on this sort of uh, lifetime uh, profit of the firm asset. And so, that's what we've done here. So we planned out various options. We're gonna start with 0.74, which might be the most reasonable because um, the survey professional forecasters, if you look at their forecasts for output growth in 2020 Q2 and 2020 Q3, you can actually back out what they think the persistence is of the shock, which was 0.74. And actually I think their 2020 Q3 forecast was quite good. So I think it's actually a reasonable starting point. And you can see that basically uh, a kind of reasonable, um, at kind of reasonable levels of persistence, these, these percentages here, they're not the percent change in the market, they're the percent of the change in the market explained by this force. So basically, you know, we saw the market drop by one third. This is what percent of that one third drop, at least in logs, we're explaining. And you can see it's explaining almost none of it. At the sort of baseline forecasted thing, it's explaining less than half a percent of the actual observed drop. And even if you get up to a persistence of something like 0 0.95, 0 0.98, which would mean that really the output drop is going to continue for a very, very long time, kind of a pessimistic view of, of the virus and vaccines and things like this, you're still only spending maybe 5, 8% of the, of the observed decline. And actually, if it was really permanent, you would actually get to up to about 24%, but that seems to me a bit... Um, that seems a bit weird to think that, that actually this is a permanent decline output. So a more reasonable... Uh, um, persistence is you're just not getting that much because we're talking about 10%. It's reverting actually at reasonably quickly over a lifetime asset like stocks. It just doesn't, doesn't square up. So now let's take a look at um, factor shares. And like I showed you, um, we kind of showed in that other work that this really is super important over the post-war sample. If you want to understand why do stocks go up so much in a one 20 year period versus another one, you kind of want to look uh, at, at factor shares, how much profit, um, how much of output actually went to profit and how did that change over that period? So we wanted to investigate the role of these factor shares on uh, the COVID episode. And in particular, we kind of know that in recessions, um, it is possible and it actually often happens that the profit share goes down often due to things like sticky wages and things like this. Actually, the labor share is sort of counter cyclical in this way. So uh, what we did below is we kind of took um, the, the um, our two components, because remember that our factor shares, we our earnings share variable has a low frequency, high frequency component. And we just said, okay, what would be the impact of a one through five standard deviation shock um, on these things? And actually we're gonna add in, to, when we look at the percentage of the market equity explained, we're gonna add in the, the kind of negligible output impact as well at our kind of baseline output parameter. And so what we find if we look at the model is, you know, yes, you of course, you know, if, with a big enough change in factor shares, you could explain the entire drop in the market. Uh, so what would that take? Well, um, for uh, the low frequency component, you'd actually have to drop it in logs by 0.231, which is gonna be, I don't know, somewhere in the ballpark of 25%. Um, or you'd have to actually drop the, uh, the high frequency component enormously. This would be like, it's in logs again, this is um, equivalent to about a 75% decrease in profit share. Um, and so you can think about, is this reasonable? And the answer I think is kind of no. So if you look here, basically, even when you go out to kind of five standard deviations, the neither component is, is really getting close to what it would need to be to, to explain this. And you can see that actually, you know, even with a very big shock, um, you, you're still only explaining somewhere between 10 or 15% of the, of the drop in the market that occurred. So for a more kind of heuristic view, if you go back to the historical data, we kind of have seen profit shares drop a lot in recessions. In fact, we have seen profit shares drop more than the, this, this minus 0.231 that you would need to see. So during the financial crisis at the outbreak of, of that crisis, we do see profit shares in logs drop actually almost exactly this much. 
But the thing is, when profit shares drop during recessions, it's almost always attributed in the model to the high frequency component, because it, it tends to be something recession-based, like sticky wages that reverts pretty quickly, as opposed to what really does the heavy lifting for the asset market, which are these kind of very long-term secular trends, uh, like from 1989 to today, of these very slow moving uh, changes. We don't tend to see those um, at such uh, rapid speeds. So in particular, you know, I can kind of give you an example of what, what it looked like the last time we had a huge decrease in profit shares. Here's the earnings share uh, over time, profit share earnings share I'm using uh, um, interchangeably. And what you can see is that, okay, over the financial crisis, we did see this big, big drop. And in particular, this is kind of the, the drop of the a huge um, downward spike that I mentioned, but you can see it's part of a broader pattern. But these also revert very, very quickly. Basically, you get a full recovery uh, in the earnings share over five years. And actually, from the lowest point, it kind of recovers even faster. Um, and that actually, in the model, points to a pretty limited direct market impact. So you can kind of see here the earnings shares dropping. Uh, but it's really uh, not, at least so far, that big uh, compared to what we saw during the financial crisis. And actually, now that some more data has come in, we can kind of see this directly. So basically we do see some kind of reasonable decline in the earnings share. It looks like about minus uh, 0.14 in logs. So that would be somewhere kind of in here. If we assume it's kind of um, from the uh, high frequency component, it could explain about 5% of the drop, but, but not much more than that. And actually in the data, it already looks like it's reverting pretty quickly. So the 2020 Q3 profit share is it basically it drops a lot in 2020 Q1, Q2 is still low, by Q3 it's back up. So I'm not gonna read too much into a single quarter, but I, I've seen no evidence that this is gonna be more persistent than what we've observed in the past when, when the profit share falls in recessions. So let's go to our final uh, explanatory uh, fundamental, which are the risk-free rates. And we see these uh, fall quite a bit, uh, where basically they go from about 0.15, they drop about 140 basis points uh, until they hit the zero lower bound. And um, again, we can try to use the model to bound the impact of this. Now, of course, this is going in a stimulating direction. So you'd think it would, if anything, would increase uh, asset prices. So it really should be used to explain the recovery, not the decline. Uh, so we're going to see how much this could possibly have done to explain this very rapid recovery. And so basically, we're going to uh, try to bound the impact with some conservative assumptions. So the first one is that our model uses real rates. We're going to assume that this drop in uh, Nominal rates all goes into the real rate. That might be a little bit aggressive because inflation's probably falling over this period. We're also gonna assume that the entire decline is attributable to the low frequency component of risk-free rates as opposed to the high frequency component. Again, as usual, low frequency, more persistent changes have a bigger effect on stock prices. This is conservative. And the model, this just has a really negligible effect. Um, and the, you know that would undo basically only about 2% of the decline in market equity. So the other 98% would still be unexplained. Uh, you know, for reference, this is because the model believes, given past data, that these changes in risk rates are not that persistent. It's seen risk rates fall by much, much more over the last, uh, whatever, 60 years at, during various periods. And it just doesn't think this is that big of a deal, because in those past episodes, it didn't move asset prices that much. Uh, this, of course, assumes that the change in rates is as persistent as in the past. If you think that actually rates are now going to be stuck at the zero lower bound, uh, really persistently, that might be a different story, uh, really like me, meaning we have like a decade there or something. Uh, but if you kind of believe that there's typical reversion, uh, basically the model can kind of rule out that just the movement in short rates is having a big effect. I'll also state the caveat that movements in you know, term premium, stuff like that, that's not gonna be captured by this, by this fundamental. So now let's go to the remaining factor, which is risk tolerance and look at how uh, it's interacted with, with policy. So basically what we found from the model is that fundamentals, uh, meaning output factor shares and risk-free rates really don't seem able to explain these market movements, which implies a dominant role for market risk tolerance. Now, what is this variable? It's kind of a catch-all that could represent true sentiment of investors, uh, market conditions for key participants, or even news about future fundamentals that hasn't shown up yet. Because in these models, uh, um, preferences about risk and uh, optimism and pessimism kind of are interchangeable in the SDF. And importantly, you might think that all three of these different um, forces could be strongly influenced by Federal Reserve policy. And in fact, we saw the Federal Reserve making a number of different um, announcements, not only of conventional policy, but of unconventional policy over this period. So we're going to try to study this with a, an event study methodology. Uh, we have the stock value uh, measured at the 10-minute frequency. And we're going to look at changes in short windows around these announcements. So basically, we have announcements that we're going to number 1 through n. They're going to include both conventional and unconventional for now. And then we're going to look at the log change in the market index. We're going to use various indices 
from basically t minus one, meaning 10 minutes before the announcement, to t plus two, meaning 20 minutes after the announcement. Uh, we're going to then put in dummies for whether the announcement occurred basically within the 10 minutes after t or the, the between 10 and 20 minutes after t. We're basically always going to sum these dummies when I show them to you. So just think of it as, as an announcement occurring in the 20 minutes after t. And we're going to look at how that influences the, um, the change in prices over this window. So what do we find? Um, again, this is kind of the sum. And we're going to start with conventional monetary policy announcement days. So these are the different dates. And this is the sort of log impact on the market according to our event study methodology. And so what you can see here basically is that none of these are really strongly positive. In fact, some of them are very strongly negative. Uh, if you actually add up the conventional policy uh, announcement responses, they actually uh, drop the market by about 17% uh, overall when you just kind of sum them up in total. Um, now, I don't think this is due to um, them being uh, necessarily smaller than expected because they did, you know, especially um, uh, over this period, move back to the zero lower bound. So how much more could markets have expected? Instead, uh, my guess is this is more about inference about market conditions where, where um, you know, like the information effect from this Nakamura and Steinson, Steinson paper of the market really learning through the Fed's announcement about how bad really economic conditions are. So now let's turn to unconventional policy, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. This is all the unconventional policy announcements kind of listed out. You can see the paper kind of for a full description of what each of them is doing. Um, even though I've done it in two panels here, that's just to fit them on the slide. It, it, it's all the same kind of a, a regression. And so these summaries are for the, entire, um, for the entire thing. And what you can see is basically there's a lot of variations. Some of them are positive, some are negative. Um, and combined, they actually don't have that big of an effect, about 1.53% in total when I sum up all the coefficients. Well, there is quite a bit of heterogeneity by the type of announcement. Um, but actually, if you kind of go and look at just the ones that are supportive, we can get a sense of maybe bounding what the impact was, at least these surprises, but also giving us a sense of actually which policies, and as policymakers that might be of interest, which announcements actually were the most supportive of the market. And so basically, uh, here's all the ones that are positive. And you can see that of, of these three really uh, stand out. So the biggest one, I've done these not in chronological order, but in order of impact, is April 9th, where we kind of see this major package promising up to 2.3 trillion in support, which is support for the Paycheck Protection Loan Facility, it also introduces two new uh, programs, the Main Street Lending Program and Municipal Liquidity Facility, and expands a number of existing facilities, uh, primary and secondary market corporate credit facilities, and the TALF, the term asset-backed securities loan facility. March 17th and 20th, which also had non-trivial impacts around the announcement, are the introduction of the primary dealer credit facility, and also uh, March 20th was about dollar swap, uh, swap lines with other central banks. So in total, uh, you can actually look across the, the, the Russell 2000 seems to have a slightly bigger impact. Um, some others have, have smaller impact. These supportive events contribute, at least the, the announcement surprises, contribute somewhere between seven and 12% to market value. Now, of course, I've selected only the ones with positive effects, so you can kind of um, uh, you know, make your own interpretations there. And of course, you know, it's worth mentioning that these results capture only the surprise component, so the total impact of the policies might differ. One thing I'll note interestingly before wrapping up, though, is that you know, despite these things actually moving markets quite a bit, only a tiny fraction of, uh, of the pledged uh, money was actually lent. It's really a pretty small sum, I mean, not small by, by personal bank account standards, but compared to the kind of amounts of lending going on in these markets, um, it's actually very interesting that, that most of the money didn't even get uh, lent at the end of the day, despite these kind of powerful impacts on, on market valuations. So let me wrap up here. Uh, in this paper, we kind of used an existing framework to ask what caused the stock market to fall by about um, a third in a month, and then kind of recover, you know, basically equally rapidly recovering basically in the next month. And we use a structural model to try to bound the role of fundamentals. And we found that basically, you know, if you are not willing to use implausible shock sizes or persistences, you're not going to get basically anything out of the cash flow. So despite the fact that that economic variables are sort of moving in unprecedented ways over this time. Um, the transitory nature, as well as sort of the limited impact of output overall, because it has to, um, you know, move in terms of its proportionality into the market, just implies that this really is not explaining what's going on, at least at the aggregate level. Uh, we found that while short rates do drop to the ZLB, this actually plays a minimal role on the recovery, unless you're willing to assume that the, the drop is much more persistent than historical in the data. And that points to really something changing about the market's ability to tolerate risk as being central to, to what happened. 
Uh, we used an event study approach to estimate how Federal Reserve policy might have impacted that risk tolerance. Um, we found conventional policy announcements are actually associated with large market declines, probably due to the information effect. Uh, but there were a subset of unconventional policy announcements that contributed uh, somewhere between 7 and 12% to the rise in market value. Um, even though actually at the end of the day, only a small fraction of the promised funds were ultimately lent over those facilities. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the interesting presentation. Uh, just a reminder, so if you ask a question, raise your hand, uh, turn on your video, unmute. I'll actually unmute you and uh, we can progress. I think I saw Gihai asking a question. Uh, let me see if I can find them. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Gihai uh, from Bank of Canada. Uh, I have a question, like actually, maybe a few questions. So first question is, uh, in the standard uh, production economy, basically the output and consumption and the uh, dividend are, are equal. And then you guys break the link and um, now the equity is, is a part of the uh, output and uh, uh, consumption is also different from the output. Uh, my question is, uh, like um, in terms of the volatility of equity consumption and output, how like how those three different uh, compare with the data? Sure, um, right. So this is kind of a question about about the baseline model, um, and it's a good one. So so one important thing that we do is, you know, if you look in in the the data on household wealth, what you're going to find is that most households in the U.S. at least have basically almost no exposure to stocks. They have like no ownership. While you have kind of a small portion who really get the vast, they have the majority of stock ownership and they actually get a huge fraction of their income from capital sources like stocks. So the first thing that we assume in the model, which I think is, is pretty important, is that um, the consumption that matters for the SDF is actually the consumption of the shareholders. We have a representative shareholder who's consuming uh, only out of the uh, payouts from the stock market. They're kind of a representative capital owner. So then on top of that, um, that's already gonna break the link between kind of consumption and output a little bit. But the question is, what are those payouts? So that's kind of in two steps. The first thing that we had like showed is that basically, if you look at the pie of output, on average, about 70% goes to labor compensation, about 20% goes to uh, taxes and interest payments, about 10% goes to after-tax profits that, that are sort of are owned by the shareholder. But that share is super variable. So it can fluctuate to kind of as low, it's on, on average 12%, it's gone as low as 8% and as high as 20%. And so fluctuations in the size of the share of the pie going to um, the stockholder can be very important for driving a wedge between profits and output already, even over horizons of decades. And finally, for payouts, um, basically because of this is like operating leverage effect, because if, uh, among that profit, kind of a, basically a fixed share has to go to reinvestment. And we kind of can back that up in the data. So at the end of the day, we're actually able to capture uh, much, much better once we go through this process of, of this tran translation from output to profit to payout. The fact that um, profits have, have risen over the last 30 years and over actually the last 60 years, uh, much more than output. And in particular, payouts have exploded compared to output because not only are profits going up, but you have this leverage effect kicking in, increasing them even more. So we actually are able to match um, the, uh, the volatility and, and average growth in, in payouts at the end of the day much, much better than you would uh, with a model where, where these things are, are much more tightly linked. Second one, I, I know like you get, you mentioned like the interest rate drop is not like a play a significant role in like uh, the explaining the, the, the valuation drop, right? Uh, but when I look at the real rate, uh, like you plot, seems like, you know, uh, after 2000, the, the literature basically found, if you look at R star, has a significant drop after thought and then the financial crisis still there's a, like a big drop there right you know the, the difference yeah i don't it looks like you know it's just a, a slightly uptick there um right so i couldn't quite catch the entire question but um if it's about the role of of um of interest rates sort of recently so basically the the caveat of the model is it really is an estimated model it doesn't um you know, it, it's just looking based on past data about how persistent it expects uh, real rates to be. And actually, um, 
you know, if you look back over at the real rate, not the nominal rate, it actually has reverted quite a bit. So you see it move around a lot over time. It's been very high, but it's also been low in the 60s. It's kind of wiggling around, goes way up in the 80s, goes back down, up, down. Um, and so the model thinks that actually this is not persistent enough to get big effects. And this is actually a place where our model really differs from a lot of work that just compares steady states. If you assume the risk-free rate, the real risk rate is changing permanently, like between steady states, you're going to find it has an enormous effect on asset prices. Um, but that's just that, not supported. That's by exactly the point. So basically, if you look at like the R star estimation, R star means like the real short, real short rate in long run. Mm -hmm. means like uh, those seems to has like uh, some kind of very persistent movement. Yeah, like, so, uh, so I understand that. So let me just say that, that our model is, is a model that has to estimate it's, it's what it expects to happen based on the past data. And, and it, if the story is this time is different and actually now real rates have moved much more persistently than the past, um, that's fair. In, in that case, you, you, you would um, extrapolate that the, uh, the effect of, of risk free rates has been bigger. Um, that's kind of a limitation of the way that we've done our model. So if you believe that, then then I think that's a that's a fair critique, and you'd have to sort of bump up those numbers. I, I will say, yeah, I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, Gordon, if you can unmute yourself, you can go next. Uh, great presentation, Daniel. Uh, I have uh, one or two comments uh, or question. Uh, one is uh, you consider this uh, large change in the earning factor share. I'm wondering whether you have also considered uh, during certain times, both during the COVID um, period as well as during the global financial crisis, we had also dividend payout restrictions that might additionally you know, prevent um, earnings to be paid out. And I know that's probably still on the shorter term effect, but maybe perhaps that increases the uh, earning factor share at type of estimate. The second uh, question, is regarding whether you look into uh, the fiscal supports. Uh, of course, the Fed have done a lot during March uh, and April, uh, but much of the market movement was also related to the fiscal supports uh, and announcements coming out of the Treasury. Uh, so that perhaps is another avenue to uh, investigate. And then uh, lastly, I think your point about the swap line and the facility take up uh, is well taken. Um, I think the facility take up numbers that you used actually doesn't include the swap line uh, usage, which is actually larger. And also the repo facility was quite large too, but that, that's kind of more towards the conventional quality. Um, yeah, okay, so let me, I hope I remember all these. So the first one was about dividends. And I can tell you, we, we haven't considered that. In the model, um, if you tell the investors, look, the dividends will be low until this policy expires and then you're gonna get them, but they kind of know that they're coming they're not going to care because they kind of are like they kind of have the patience implied by the bond by by the bond market so they're they're actually pretty patient at waiting as long as it's a sure thing um now i don't know if that's that's how you think about investors in reality but that's that's what the model would say so i think that that impact would be pretty limited um the second kind was a fiscal policy i think that's a great point i mean for sure i'm sure markets were hanging on this it's a little bit trickier to get a, a clean announcement window that's really going to surprise the market you'd have to really pin down when that happened but i think it's totally reasonable to think that that played a big role. And along the last point, um, I think the point is super well taken. I also want to say the fact that actually not all of the facilities were used, I don't think means that they were somehow like a, a failure. I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we are finding they were effective. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of like the, the a lot of a lot of events we've seen with unconventional monetary policy, um, they can have huge impacts on, on market risk tolerance, even if they don't really end up actually um, showing up with huge uh, numbers in, in real terms. Although, as you pointed out, I, I'm, I'm I completely am, am confident that, that you're right, that these swap lines, et cetera, may have actually played a big role in terms of actually uh, shuffling resources around. I mean, I, absolutely, actually. I think personal opinion is the best type of facilities are the ones that you announce have a market impact, but doesn't get utilized. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Uh, Andreas next and then Andrew, uh, and then we're gonna move on to uh, Andreas as a presenter. And just, just a quick question, I mean, coming back to Gihai's question about the interest rate, because it is so, somewhat surprising that you assume a one half percent drop and still kind of your model doesn't pick this up. So I wonder, and I see why it happens. Um, I wonder, could you use the forward guidance policies to dig a bit deeper into this sort of in your, in your event study framework? Because it, presumably, you know, these are messages about, I mean, to the extent that they affect real rates, they're messages about keeping things constant for a long time, which is therefore potentially Induce a break in the correlation that you have. 
in, in maybe historical data? Um, yeah, I think that's a good, that's a great idea. Um, and in particular, I think, um, you know, the survey of professional forecasters, for example, has uh, has series about the average path of real of, of well, the average path of short rates over 10 years, and you can use their inflation forecast to uh, make that kind of a real number. Um, and actually, you know, that's something that we're looking at even for the other we're looking at for both papers, because uh, that that number is a little bit more persistent than than what our model would imply. So um, now I don't know who's who's right and who's wrong. Uh, but in this case, I think it might be valuable to see if, you know, especially you, you can go into this scenario and see, are they expecting a much more persistent movement? Um, we can look into that. I think it's a good idea. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, so I just had a brief question on the uh, event study on, on uh, fiscal policy announcements. Um, I, I was, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on the, I guess, the lack of information content you would get from the from the non-traditional policy announcements that wouldn't wouldn't also trigger a sort of negative reaction in the markets. Like, why why are we why the heterogeneity there in such an extreme, you know, non-traditional measure uh, in, in the market reaction? Um, so here, I think you probably have to dig policy by policy, and we we've kind of done some work at looking at. Um, you know, news reactions and things like this, but it's a tricky one. I mean, all every every announcement is gonna, you know, by an informed actor like not only informed and an influential actor like the Federal Reserve, is gonna both contain, um, you know, a surprise about the policy, um, and then information about not only like economic fundamentals, but even like future policy, you know, things that are not even uh, necessarily contained. And of course, they're all relative to what the market expected the policy to be in the first place. And all of these things are very difficult to measure. So um, I would say the point is pretty well taken. Uh, we're hoping this was kind of gonna be, you know, just a, a guideline to put some numbers on kind of the direct surprise effects. Um, but um, we'd have to dig a little bit deeper, I think into like a careful, more careful analysis to really get, you know, say with confidence that, that information effects aren't in the positive ones as well as the negative ones, if that's the, if that's the, the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're gonna try to take a two minute break and then move on to the next presentation by Andreas. So um, uh, I think Anne will probably uh, break us now. Thank you. See you in two minutes. Thanks so much.
Okay, so welcome back. Now we are ready to move to the third session for today's program. Uh, the third speakers of today is Andrea Surteman. Uh, Andreas is senior economist at the Financial Market Division at the Bank of Canada, but also research affiliate with the Systemic Risk Center at the LSE. So as before, Andreas will uh, present for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open the floor for uh, questions. So Andreas, uh, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Sure, let me try to do this actually. Slideshow. And then, uh, no, that's the wrong way around. I think I have to first share screen and then slideshow. <laughs> uh, share screen. And now let's do this way around. Yes, can you hear me? You see the screen? Excellent. Okay, so today, oops, it moves by itself. So today I'll be um, talking about a paper that a um, couple of people from the Systemic Risk Center and uh, Lerby and I from the Bank of Canada have been working on together since the start of COVID. It's called the term structure of market fear, central bank responses to COVID-19. And let me start with a well-known quote from Olivier Beauchamp, who was at the time chief economist of the IMF. And back then in 2009, he said, crises feed uncertainty. And uncertainty affects behavior which feeds the crisis. So what are policymakers to do? First and foremost, reduce uncertainty. Do so by removing tail risk and the perception of tail risk. So this quote points to the risk-taking channel of monetary policy. Essentially, a central bank has the ability to reduce downside risk in financial markets by providing liquidity in money and asset markets and by backstopping short-term debt. And reducing risk strengthens banks and borrowers' balance sheet, and that in turn increases the willingness of lenders to extend credit. So this is the channel how this risk-taking channel works. And that was one of the main policy lessons of 2008. Actually, in crisis, you want to act, act fast and decisively in order to prevent the corrosive buildup of risk. Okay. So here in this paper, we zoom in on this risk-taking channel. So in March and April 2020, we've seen a flurry of central bank activity along a broad set of policy instruments. And it's important to understand if and how central bank actions influence risk perception during the crisis. And whether some instruments in the central bank crisis toolkit were better than others in achieving this goal. So for this talk, we focus on the Federal Reserve's policy and to what extent they managed to influence markets' tail risk perception during the crisis. To do so, we construct daily indices of tail risk perception in US and international stock markets using a rich data set of option prices. To see how the Fed's action influenced uh, these risk perceptions, we class the action into five broad policy categories. And we show kind of, uh, the heterogeneous impact of these policy instruments on tail risk perception. And specifically, we show that policies that were targeted at liquidity provision for market functioning had a very strong impact on these perceptions. We also document strong spillovers of those Fed policies into risk perceptions in non-US markets. And when I say markets, I always say stock, uh, we focus on stock markets here. And these work specifically via the US dollar swap lines. Okay. What I'll do in the following is, first of all, I'll show you what data we use in order to construct these tail risk perceptions. I then talk about the Fed actions, and then I relate the Fed actions to these risk perceptions and show you uh, heterogeneous impacts along Federal Reserve policy instruments. Uh, so firstly, to construct our perceptions of stock market risk, we use daily option prices for US international stock indices that we obtain from IHS markets total consensus pricing service. This is one of the biggest consensus pricing services in the OTC derivative markets. And the key advantage of this data is that it gives us extremely extreme strike prices and very long maturities for options. So because it cover, covers part of the OTC market. So we can go from maturities of one week up to 10 years, and we have strike prices which go up to 20% of the current index value for put options and up to 20% of um, the index for call options, for example. Here, I give you a snapshot of the kind of data we work uh, with. This is um, an index option, the index option prices for the S&P 500 index with a time to expiry of one year on March 2020 and 2020, so at the height of the COVID crisis. Each black dot 
corresponds to an option price from this option pricing service. And you see we go from very deep strike prices, this is 30% in terms of forward moneyness, uh, all the way to almost 200 in terms of forward moneyness um, for this one year ahead um, option contract. And option prices are uh, ideal for backing out risk perceptions because they tell you something about the likelihood of the market attaches to certain index moves at a, at a given horizon. So from option prices, you can back out distribution of future index moves at different time horizons. And that's exactly what we do here. So essentially what we do is we use SAT procedures to back out risk neutral return distributions for investment higher horizons going from one week up to 10 years for a range of stock market indices. And we work in terms of log return, excess log return distributions. So when we look at the distribution of returns, we look at the log return of the index that includes dividend payments and we subtract the risk-free rate for the corresponding horizon. So this is basically um, our object of, um, of attention here is this RT tau in this um, uh, framework here, where this is a log return for a given um, investment horizon of tau months ahead. As I said, we have daily option prices for a range of indices. So the our object of interest in the end is shown in the graph here. We obtain essentially distributions of these log returns. And in this graph, I show you two return distributions for two adjacent days for the S&P 500 with a maturity of one, one year. So the red line is the CDF or excess log return of these S&P 500 on March 19th, 2020. The blue line is the log excess return distribution for the S&P 500 on March 20th. So this is basically one snapshot of, of, of the objects we'll be working with. On the x-axis, you see the excess log return for these indices. Uh, for, for, yeah, for this specific um, uh, time horizon and this index. And on the y-axis, you see the corresponding probability. And if you look at the horizontal line where it intersects with the CDF, this is the 10% quantile of the risk neutral distribution. So this is the 10% worth return on March 19th. And this is a 10% worth return in terms of excellent return on March 20th for the S&P 500 over one year horizon. And you see that from March 19th, to March 20th, this quantile, 10% quantile went up. So things got better between these two days. And we will exactly look at these daily changes in these 10% quantiles and relate this to Federal Reserve action to see how risk perception um, changed in the market day to day. So this is just repeating uh, what I said. So we really look at the quantiles. This is the formal definition of the quantile that we look at. And for those who are more familiar with value at risk, you can also think of it as a risk neutral T month ahead value at risk. That's basically what, the, what these quantiles are in the risk neutral um, distribution. We think focusing on the risk neutral distribution is the way to, um, to go um, because it is really the decision of the distribution. The risk distribution, if you um, uh, remember, is the objective distribution of returns adjusted for the market's willingness to pay for insurance. So bad events receive a higher weight on the risk neutral distribution. And to the extent that this is, um, the risk distribution um, is the one that drives actions in the market, we think that this is the best, uh, the, the best way to look at uh, markets, markets perceptions during the COVID crisis. Okay, now here's the data for the 10% risk neutral quantile for the S&P 500 at different terms, going from 2008 all the way to the COVID crisis. The color scheme, um, so here you have the quantiles on the y-axis, 10% quantiles. The color scheme indicates time horizons. So red is one month ahead, uh, blue is one year ahead, and five is um, um, green is five years ahead. So it is very interesting to contrast 2008 with 2020. So you see that 2020 COVID was very extreme and very fast in the buildup at the short end. You see a very extreme drop in the one month quantile and the one year ahead quantile compared to uh, 2008. However, in terms of the long term terrorist perceptions, so if you look at the five year perception, 2008 is much more extreme than 2000, 2020. So this is a nice contrast of the term structure of these quantiles, which we think illustrates the difference of 2020 being a liquidity crisis with 2008 being a banking crisis, which had much more long-term severe consequences. Okay, now let's zoom in on COVID. This is our COVID sample period. Um, as I said, these are daily 
quantized, so it's the same picture as before, going from beginning of February all the way to the end of July. Again, for the one month red, one year blue, five years green. And what I've indicated here, and hopefully you can see it, the vertical dotted lines are Federal Reserve actions. So every dotted line corresponds to a Federal Reserve announcement. So is a Fed action in response or a, a COVID Fed, Fed action. So we've, let me show you what, um, and, and we will relate these actions to the changes in the quantize. So this is going to be the exercise here. We want to see how these different actions, how they influence the quantiles of these, of these, of these distribution of different horizons. Now, how do we look uh, construct uh, our um, Fed actions? Well, what we've done is we've looked at all policy announcements of the Fed between February 3rd and July 29th in terms of press releases. So there were 44 press releases and some press releases had more than just one policy event as we define them. So in total, we have 51 policy events. And as I said, we want to study the heterogeneous impact of different policy instruments of the Feds on these risk perceptions. So in order to do so, we categorize the policies by the Fed into five categories. And, and specifically, um, we categorize them into interest rate decisions, that would, for example, be the lowering of the interest rate of the Fed on the 3rd of March. Liquidity support for market functioning. This would be uh, things like the primary um, dealer credit facility of the, of, of the Fed. This would be uh, US treasury purchases in order to support market functioning. Credit to household firms in the public sector. For example, the Main Street Lending Facility would fall into that category. Market prudential policies. Uh, that would, for example, be the very important one, be the exemption of treasuries and deposit at the Fed from uh, the supplementary leverage ratio calculations would be part of that group. And then lastly, at policies, which are the Fed US dollar swap lines and the FEMA repo facility that has been announced later. So basically, we used expert judgment to classify every single policy that's mentioned in the press release within that time period into those five categories. And then we really want to see. So one problem you obviously have in evaluating the effect of these of these of these uh, policies is that really things move very fast and thick around COVID. So we really want to isolate the the, the effects of these in the individual policies. In order to do so, we use something very similar to to what Daniel did in the previous paper, which is basically uh, we use instantaneous reaction the S&P 500 to these announcements. But we, here we use them to identify shocks, and then we use these shocks to relate this to the risk of distribution. So it's a bit of a different exercise from the previous paper, but essentially it's the same idea. So here's a picture of what we do. These are the prices of the e mini futures on March 23rd, 2020. There were two announcements on the March 23rd. The first one was one relating to uh, US Treasury purchases uh, for market functioning at 8 o'clock. And then the Fed made a second announcement at 9.15. And that was a market prudential announcement, basically allowing banks to eat into their capital, their capital buffer. So th these were the two announcements. And uh, similar to what, what we've seen in the previous paper, we evaluate the shock component of the policy by looking at movements in the S&P 500 index in 30 minute windows around the announcement. So the green box indicates these 30 minute windows. The end of the green box is 20 minutes after the announcement. The beginning of the box is 10 minutes before, and our shock will be the price here minus the price at the bottom. So this is going to be the shock. And here that will be a liquidity policy related shock. And same here. So we're going to subtract to construct this market potential shock. We'll subtract this price or this price from that price. And that will be a negative shock here. Whereas this one will be a positive shock as you can see. Okay. So these are these announcement surprises. Um, so for each policy P on day T for announcement A, we get a surprise. And here's um, you see uh, statistics for these surprises. And that also comes back to the previous paper. You see the mean, and uh, as previously was conjectured, some of these surprises might have actually been negative surprises. And you see this for market prudential, for example. Market prudential, and, and to the extent that um, it is probably an information shock in the sense that the market infers something from these market prudential effects rather than the market prudential effects themselves being bad. It's probably something that the market, well, it's the same is not true for other categories. So if you really kind of dig into these categories, you see that they have typically different average shock, uh, shock size effects. Um, shock effects in terms of sign, the size and size deviation are not, not too far apart from each other. And then in order to construct our shock for day T for policy P, 
we just sum the surprises if there were several announcements in a given category on a given day, and otherwise we set these shocks equal to zero. So that's basically our policy shocks. So you see we have five different policy shocks here, time series, depending uh, on the category of the announcement type. And we normalize these shocks by the average shock size across policies, so that basically one corresponds to a typical shock on, um, uh, across the announcement period. Now, next step, as I said, is we take those shocks, which we see as policy shocks in a given category, and we relate those to daily changes in the risk neutral quantiles. And our main focus will be the 10% risk neutral quantiles. So you see the regressions we run will have as the dependent variable daily changes in the quantiles at different horizons. So Q delta QT tau will be the change in the 10% quantile for an investment horizon of tau month ahead between day T minus one and day T. And we regress this on the policy shock. So we do two different regressions. First of all, we bunch all policy shocks together. So we just see what is the overall effect of a Fed action on these quantiles, controlling for COVID infections, fiscal actions, and also previous day uh, financial market uncertainty to control for some mean reversion. And then we dig deeper into the heterogeneity of these impacts by running the same regression, but now separate, uh, having separate coefficients for each shock. So we basically, we have the interest rate shock, we have the uh, liquidity shock, credit, credit, facility, credit shocks, market potential shocks, and FX shocks here, which each are coefficient by themselves. And to the extent that we have these daily risk um, quantiles, um, quantile changes on the left hand side, a positive coefficient would be a good thing. A positive co co coefficient means that a positive policy shock of the Fed, so a positive surprise by the market in terms of how the Fed acted on the, in that dimension, will move the quantile up. So will reduce the tail or the bad outcomes in the tail of the distribution. In the end, because, as I said, we have, um, we can have, we calculate these color quantiles from all the way from one week all the, all the way up to 10 years, but here in the paper we only look at up to five years, or today we only look at five years, we get a whole impact term structure for these policies. So we can see how they move the quantiles at one month, one year ahead, five year ahead. So we can see what the effect was. Now, Let's just look at the overall impact of the of, of, of Fed, Fed policy shocks. Um, and here, please focus on the red line. That is the 10% quantile. Uh, in particular, if on the y-axis we plot the coefficient, so that's this that's this B, um, B coefficient here for different horizons. So on the x-axis you have the tau's basically a month going all the way from sort of two weeks all the way to five years. And these will give you the coefficients of you know, how a policy shock by the Fed has moved the quantile. And we see that typically they move the quantile up. The dots correspond to significance of these effects. So a big dot means that the coefficient is estimated at 1% significance. Medium size means 5% and small means basically insignificant. So, but we see that overall in the term structure, the Fed policies tended to reduce tail risk or reduce market fear if you prefer that notion. Now let's dig into the heterogeneity of these effects because I said so the, the, the real interesting bit is, is, is separating those into its five components. As I said, we run this regression where we now uh, run the daily changes on, um, in, in, of the 10% quantiles, risk micro quantiles on the individual shock series with a coefficient, one coefficient per shock series. Um, and here you see the coefficients for the five shock series. So we have, same picture as before, but now the individual coefficients for interest rate policy shocks, market potential policy shocks, FX policy shocks, liquidity for market functioning policy shocks, and credit to households, firms, um, and the public sector. And what's striking here is that really the policies that seem to have had the strongest effect on tail risk perceptions in the market are really the ones that we would think more directly relate to liquidity provision in financial markets. Um, so, and it's very natural to think of this as if, um, um, the risk-taking channel kind of, um, I initially mentioned, uh, meaning reducing balance sheet constraints of, of, of banks, uh, reducing risk premium in these markets. Whereas interest rate um, surprises and, and surprises in terms of, no, I've lost my screen, uh, in terms of credit provision, do not seem to have moved the risk neutral quantiles significantly at any, at any horizon. 
Now, I should be careful here to mention that really we do not evaluate the overall effectiveness of the Fed, Fed's act, actions. I mean, they have a dual mandate, price stability, employment. Here, we really specifically talk about these tail risk perceptions. So the perception of severely adverse outcomes in financial markets. But to the extent that, that these are obviously very important for financial stability, that, that also feeds into the Fed's, Fed's mandate indirectly. So, so it tells us something about the effectiveness of, of um, crisis policy tools. And here specifically, I think the point is that it points towards uh, liquidity um, crisis policy tools to having been very effective during the COVID crisis at all horizons. Okay, now what we do is we look at, so this is the US uh, and specifically this is the S&P 500 here. Now we look at the international spillovers of Fed policies onto other markets. And uh, the first one I'm going to show you is the British market, the UK market. So here that's the same exercise. We extract risk neutral quantize 10% from the FTSE 100, which is the main stock market index for the UK. And we look at daily changes in these 10% quantiles at different horizons on the very same policy shocks of the Fed. So to what extent did the Fed have spillovers into other markets in terms of risk perceptions, uh, especially perceptions about very severe outcomes. And you see here um, that really the, the one policy that seemed to have, and that's maybe called, uh, intuitive, seemed to have the strongest spillover effects were really the FX swap line policies that the Fed rolled out. Um, which is, uh, is specifically in the UK not particularly surprising because uh, it's the seat of a very important euro dollar market and uh, a lot of the important global banks like Barclays, for example, turn up in the FTSE 100. So you would think that these uh, actions most likely relieved uh, US dollar funding pressures and, and uh, this would have US dollar funding uh, offshore is typically provided by, by these big global banks. So that would be, I mean, would be an intuitive uh, reason for seeing this, uh, these spillovers of the FX swap lines. You can also see that the liquidity for market functioning had some, some spillovers, uh, but um, the, the, real, the, the really interesting bit is here, the FX swap lines, which are one of the new crisis policy tools in the FED's toolbox, and we see it working in real time here um, in, our, in our data. Now, again, we will zoom in a bit more on the, on the swap lines. And what we do now is we look at four indices, uh, we look at the UK market, the FTSE 100, the DAX, which is the German index, uh, the Nikkei, and the COSPI, which is the South Korean index, uh, the main stock market index. And we take our FX policy shock, shock and we split into two. We uh, separate into a policy shock that refers to existing uh, swap line arrangements that were already in place before the crisis. And then these were with uh, the Bank of England, ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Switzerland, and the Bank of Canada and new swap line arrangements that were rolled out during um, uh, the COVID crisis and reached new central banks, like the Bank of Korea, for example. And we see to what extent uh, these separate shocks separate, have separate in impacts on the risk perceptions in these international markets. And you see here uh, that really changes to the existing swap lines, and specifically one of the big changes was going from weekly swap lines to daily swap lines for the Bank of England, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan really seem to have been the, the shocks that, that had, were most closely associated with uh, reductions in Taylor's perception uh, in, in the local indices. For Korea, you see those changes did not seem to have uh, fed into the market, but changes that, um, that provided Korea or the Bank of Korea access to US dollar funding really seem to have had strong effects uh, along all maturities on risk perception in the Korean market. So not only do we see, let me just summarize this, not only do we see clear effects of FX um, policies on the US dollar, on the US market in terms of the S&P 500, which is the channel that, for example, Bahaki and, and Reese talk about the swap line paper, which means it, it stabilizes US foreign demand for US dollar denominated assets, and therefore it's not surprising that it would sort of improve market vision US markets. It also spills over the swap line policies into, into other, other international markets, potentially leading, for example, balance sheet pressures of, of global banks. That's one way to think about it. So they have um, really um, strong, they, they seem to have had strong effects. And that's, that's one of, I guess, the most striking results of our exercise here. So let me conclude 
So what we've done here is we studied the impact of FOD, FED, um, FOD surprises during COVID-19 on stock markets' tariffs perceptions. That was possible because we had access to a rich data set of daily option prices. And uh, we used a high frequency identification approach to isolate policy, uh, Fed policy prices by category. Consistent with the nature of the COVID-19 crisis, we find that policies that were targeted at liquidity provision for financial markets seem to have had the strongest impact on Taylor's perception. And what's particularly interesting is that we find strong impacts of Fed swap lines, not only on the US markets, but also on the international markets. Um, so we see, find them to be a particularly uh, effective policy um, crisis tool to reduce uh, risk perception markets. And that really speaks to the dominant role as the US dollar as a funding currency, and therefore also uh, you know, as a global risk factor. Um, and that's something that Shin, Shin and Puno uh, have, have raised that issue um, some time ago. OK, so that's, that's what we do here. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. So now we can open the floor for questions. Please use the radio and uh, uh, facility uh, in, the, in the participants box, and we will unmute you. Questions so far? Could I ask a question? Yes, please. Andreas, uh, very nice paper. Uh, I have a question mainly regarding you know, you use this measure of risk neutral density uh, on the tail end of the equity uh, distribution implied from the option market. We know that from risk neutral densities, it's a reflection of both uh, the fundamentals, uh, the expectation from the physical expectation, as well as the uh, risk premium. Uh, do you have any thoughts to, you know, in these sharp market movements, uh, whether how much of it was a reflection of the physical distribution shifts versus the risk premium or movements in the SDF that are affecting this process? Yeah, thanks for the question. So what we don't do is we don't do a decomposition exercise here. Um, I mean, the papers by Ian Martin, for example, that show you how you could do this that we don't do here. So we really focus just on the risk neutral. So we a priori, we can't speak to the decomposition into, into to what extent did the Fed reduce the objective probability of severely adverse outcomes in the future and to what extent did it just work on risk premium uh, and therefore basically that's why you see um, the quantiles going up. Uh, the, the, the results somewhat point towards the risk premium channel to the extent that the liquidity actions seem to have relieved pressure by quite a bit and that would be consistent with reducing just um, the, the liquidity premium on asset prices so that, that are intermediated, say, by the big global banks. So it would be, for example, consistent with the leverage, leverage channel or the intermediate asset, intermediary asset pricing sort of ideas of, 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 of um, asset prices. So, so I, I, you know, but I, a priori, we don't speak to this. But uh, indicative, I would say, risk premium. OK, other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you, Andreas, once again. And I think we can move to, to the next and last session for today. So I will hand over to Larry. I think you're muted. Yeah, that happens more often, I guess. Well, for the next session, we're going to go to uh, Gordon Liao. Same rules apply again. Save your questions to the end of the presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a um, five-minute uh, time window to ask questions about the paper and then a 15-minute uh, session to ask general questions and have a discussion. Uh, and then John will basically uh, end the conference. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Gordon, the floor is yours. Uh, take it away. Great. Thank you so much for including this paper in this uh, important discussion. And uh, I am presenting the work with uh, Tony Zhang, who is also at the Federal Reserve. And uh, the topic of this discussion is the hedging channel exchange rate determination. It's a broader framework to think about exchange rate market movements in the spot, in the forward and the swap uh, rates. Uh, but we uh, discuss and apply this framework to the COVID period, uh, which will be the topic of this discussion. Uh, 
I want to stress the views here are ours and not uh, necessarily the Federal Reserve's. So the basic motivation behind this paper is to resolve a very long-standing puzzle in the international finance literature. And this is coming from the old literature around almost 40 years ago by Mies and Rogoff, that there's an exchange rate disconnect, that exchange rate movements are uh, seemingly disconnected with measurable economic fundamentals, or in fact, any sort of uh, measurements that we could obtain. This paper takes a view of financial channels and financial intermediaries being very important. As that we learn more about the data that are available and what these financial intermediaries do, uh, we're able to assess the higher frequency movements that could potentially explain uh, the broader exchange rate market, uh, as well as explain uh, additional observations that were made uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic during recent crisis. So more recently, uh, since this uh, Mies and Rogoff paper around 40 years ago, uh, there has been many studies on intermediary constraints and global imbalances as drivers of exchange rate. Uh, these more recent studies have been more theoretical in nature. Uh, so in contrast to those, our focus will be uh, very heavily empirical, but we also spell out a precise mechanism of how to connect exchange rate dynamics with external imbalances uh, which are slower and more persistent moving uh, by introducing financial constraints. And this particular financial constraint comes from uh, the behavior of investors uh, hedging their exchange rate as well as a limited intermediation. The brief outline of this paper, what we find is we first provide a model connecting investors uh, hedging demand and external imbalance to exchange rate behavior. We show that variations in hedging demand explains movements in the forward exchange rate, the spot exchange rate, option prices in currency, as well as FX swaps. Then finally, we explain the differences in the usage of uh, the Fed swap line in the cross section, uh, which is, I think is very relevant to this discussion. So first, starting with some motivational facts and uh, newly documented uh, facts, uh, one is uh, currency hedging is a very large component uh, of what drives uh, the FX market. So in this graph, uh, what I'm plotting here in blue is the hedge ratio, the currency hedge ratio of large Japanese life insurance companies. And for those of you who don't know, large Japanese life insurance companies hold a lot of US dollar assets as they are uh, one of the premier institutions in Japan that invest in the US. The fact that we want to highlight is one uh, that this hedge ratio has been historically relatively high, especially after the global financial crisis. Two is that it is very counter cyclical. As you can see, this blue line goes up during times of financial stress, uh, which is proxied by the currency volatility index, the CVIX, which is similar to the VIX. And these hedge ratios tend to uh, become lower again uh, during times of more calm financial conditions. This is perhaps a behavioral reflection of investors' fear, uh, but what this does is this uh, fluctuates the hedge ratio, the amount of hedge that uh, institution investors had to put up. And we show that this hedge ratio really matters for the currency market at a higher frequency, at uh, the daily frequency that matters a lot more for exchange rate movements uh, than the slower moving persistent external imbalances that we see uh, to be less of a uh, predictor or ex explanatory variable for exchange rate movements. The second set of uh, motivating facts is that the foreign exchange derivative market have grown substantially in the last two decades. And when I say derivative market, it really means the forward and the swap as well as the option market, although the option market is smaller. And this graph is from the BIS triennial survey uh, on foreign exchange rate. Um, as you can see that, you know, early in the 1990s, uh, there were uh, about on par volume of daily spot exchange rate movement uh, volume, as well as forward and swap. Uh, but over the last 20 years or so, the growth in the exchange rate market has really been dominated by these uh, FX derivative instruments, the forwards and swaps. Uh, 
Uh, so this motivates us to study a relatively understudied part of the exchange market and explain uh, how these, these derivative markets affect the exchange rate movements. The third set of motivational uh, issue that I will discuss is the central bank swap lines as previously alluded uh, in the previous presentations. Uh, the central bank swap lines are crucially important. In fact, uh, they were the most utilized Fed facilities during COVID-19. Uh, they are straddling somewhere between the traditional facilities uh, such as you know, uh, repo purchase and the non-traditional uh, such as the credit facilities that were put up. Uh, but in fact, they were during the peak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, or the market turmoil, the draws on the swap line almost reached $500 billion, which was uh, one of the largest single uh, balance sheet items on the Fed's balance sheet and larger than the repo facilities take up. When we decided uh, to expand the swap line counterparties in March, uh, to from the five traditional uh, standing facilities to nine additional central bank counterparties. Uh, part of the idea was that we see that th there must be a lot of dollar needs by countries that uh, we think are more of deficit in dollar. Uh, these are countries that are perhaps in emerging market settings that have a lot of dollar debt. But what we in fact observed, uh, which is somewhat counterintuitive, is that these countries, even among the ones that were uh, emerging market, the countries that took up on the swap line the most were countries that are generally considered, considered as surplus countries. These are countries in the developed market would be uh, Japan, so BOJ had a large take up and the ECB. And in the uh, emerging market context, uh, the countries that took up the most in the swap line were countries uh, such as Korea and Singapore, and much less so by uh, countries such as Mexico and Brazil. So this is somewhat of a puzzle uh, for a bit, and I will try to resolve this uh, through thinking about uh, this model, this framework of the hedging channel of exchange rate determination. So what we do in this study is we develop a model connecting hedging demand, external imbalance, and exchange rate behavior this is a uh, model with representative investors in each country that must hedge a fraction of the net foreign asset position uh, in dollar uh, with either for swap contracts. And their hedging behavior, we uh, also endogenize to be uh, dependent on the exchange rate volatility. But largely, it is uh, driven by the exchange rate volatility uh, where the investors choose to hedge uh, a certain fraction of their asset positions so that they could maintain the same payoff of their investments in local currency. Uh, this is very much a financial intermediary story where the financial intermediaries provide and manufactures forward and swap contracts and in turn charges a spread. This spread has uh, been documented as CIP deviation by some papers in uh, practice, it's oftentimes just a price of the FX swap, which I will discuss later. And we show that uh, through the R model, the prediction is that the magnitude and the direction of the FX swap basis depend on the external imbalance and the hedge ratio, as well as the uh, magnitude and uh, magnitude of the FX swap land draws uh, during the COVID period. So in terms of financial distress, because investors increase their hedge demand, uh, this leads to very predictable movements uh, in the time series as well as the cross sections of exchange rate and swap prices. So we show also a set of empirical evidence uh, from the most recent pandemic period of these behaviors, as well as document institutional disclosures uh, that showcase why uh, certain institutions had to fulfill uh, mandatory regulatory rules for managing their currency risk mismatch. So the focus for this talk, I will discuss mostly on the empirical side, uh, but I will go over the model briefly. So first to go over some definitions so everyone uh, have the same background and same understanding, let me just talk about the different FX instruments. So FX spot is exactly what you think of as exchange rate. It's a direct exchange of currency, usually a settlement of T plus two days uh, from the time you trade. FX forward, uh, which is represented by F, it's 
actually similar to FX spot, except the uh, the exchange is not at T plus two days, but it's at T plus N. And N could be very long, could be a year, could be two years, or even longer. Usually, FX forwards are of uh, a couple of months, a couple of weeks or a month in uh, maturity. Then when you combine the FX spot and the forward transactions together uh, in opposite directions, uh, we get an FX swap. So an FX swap is a combination of doing a forward transaction but simultaneously as doing a, a, a spot transaction. Alternative interpretation of an FX swap is that it is a collateralized dollar loan uh, because you, for instance, one could buy yen against dollar at uh, T plus two days, and then also agree to sell the yen um, at T plus N days. So effectively, this is almost as if, you know, in this diagram, uh, for instance, Nippon Life is uh, lending out yen and borrowing dollar uh, with JP Morgan. In time period zero, there's an initial exchange of cash flow based on the spot exchange rate. And in time uh, t equals to one, there is a final exchange rate uh, reversing the previous transaction where the agreed amount of dollar is based on the forward value agreed at time t, t equals to zero. So for, current, for surplus countries or investment surplus countries such as Japan, where they hold a lot of US dollar assets uh, to obtain dollar uh, and to hedge the exchange rate risk, the Nippon Life, for instance, would uh, exchange the yen they hold into dollars, uh, going through an intermediary, and then invest in the dollar asset. Uh, at the reverse, at the end of the transaction, at the end of the payoff of the US dollar investment, they would reverse this uh, through the forward. Now, uh, FX swap basis, which is a measurement of the spread between the forward and the spot exchange rate adjusted for interest rate differential, this is also known as a deviation from covered interest rate parity or CIP deviation. And this really captures the price of transaction uh, in the FX swaps market. And it measures a relative valuation of uh, the forward with respect to the spot exchange rate. This measure will be a key focus of, this, uh, of the empirical measures. It's also a key focus for policymakers when we evaluate the effectiveness of the central bank swap lines and how they impact uh, the FX swap market. So FX, so the central bank swap line is simply a dollar loan uh, from the Federal Reserve to foreign central banks, uh, which then unlend the dollar that they get from the Fed in their local jurisdictions uh, against collaterals that the local firms are posting to the foreign central banks. Uh, so in a way the Fed is lending to other uh, firms outside of the U.S. Uh, by going through the foreign central banks to uh, alleviate the concerns about credit risks of these uh, other for the firms outside of the U.S. I would not go through the model in detail because uh, it is rather extensive, uh, but it's I will go over a brief overview. This is a market segmentation model uh, with downward sloping demand curve and upward sloping supply curve. And the, uh, the crucial point of the model is to show that uh, when there are financial intermediaries that manufacture certain contracts, such as the forwards and swaps, uh, you could have a basis or a spread, in this case, an FX basis spread or CIP deviation that is reflective of the demand pressure. So the larger the demand pressure on currency forward, and the bigger the spread, the FX basis spread would be, as well as there could be a spillover in that if there's an increased amount of hedging pressure from, for instance, foreign investors buying uh, dollar forwards or selling dollar forwards, uh, there could be a spillover into the spot exchange market by these intermediaries. And the currency basis as well as the spot exchange rate are determined by uh, the supply and demand of uh, various currency contracts used for both hedging of financial assets as well as by other sectors of the economy. Of course, I'll focus on the financial aspect, uh, but know that, of course, there are other drivers. And uh, the model also captured this idea of risk premium and currency crash risk relating to the broader discussion of how we can generate uh, predictable uh, exchange rate returns 
And the reason the simple intuition is in terms of market distress, uh, the foreign investors or US investors could increase the hedge ratio age. This exerts more price pressure on the forward exchange rate, which spills over to the spot exchange rate, creating a currency crash risk uh, that cannot be mapped directly to fundamentals, but could be mapped uh, to these financial shifts in hedging ratio. And as a result of this sort of currency crash risk that we observe in times of market distress, there needs to be a uh, compensation in normal times. And then that could explain the average uh, risk premium uh, among different currencies. And lastly, we also, of course, in this model discuss the central bank usage and show that investment surplus countries draw more on the swap line uh, because they are more invested in US dollar assets. So when they increase their currency hedging, they are the ones who are uh, in fact borrowing from the Fed indirectly rather than the countries that are in deficit of US debt already, uh, when they increase currency hedging, they would actually be um, exerting price pressure in the opposite direction, not borrowing more, but actually trying to unload some of their exposures. So going over some schematics, uh, so this is, you know, considering without FX hedging, if H is equal to zero, then in a very simple world, uh, Japanese investors invest in US dollar asset, but later period, they would receive the proceed in yen. Um, so it would be the original investment times some rate of return uh, times the spot exchange rate at period as uh, the second period. But this type of investment is subject to fluctuations in the uh, exchange rate risk. So what oftentimes, oftentimes uh, investors do is to hedge this exchange rate risk by engaging the forward markets so that will have uh, the forward rate uh, that are substituting for the spot rate and the forward rate is determined ahead of times. But this has to go through an intermediary and because intermediaries are constrained, uh, we would observe a spread between the forward and the spot market. And this would also uh, spill over into the spot exchange rate directly. So without going through the details of the model, I'll just jump to uh, the, some of the propositions and conclusions uh, that are predicted by the model. The first proposition is that countries with the positive external imbalance, such as Japan, have uh, FX swap basis that indicates an overvalue forward for their local currency versus countries that are negative external imbalance, such as New Zealand, have FX swap basis that indicate an undervaluation of forwards relative to the spot for their home currency. And the intuition is that in surplus countries, uh, they actually receive the dollar proceeds at maturity of their investment, sometimes in the future. And this could be, equity investment could take uh, a very long time. And so they would roll the forwards. But overall, the demand for uh, the forwards are in their local currency because they want to hedge uh, and protect their investment in their local currency. But it is costly to produce these forwards by intermediaries. Therefore, their local forwards become more overvalued uh, in the forward space. Uh, the deficit countries experience the exact opposite. Uh, they want to protect the amount of liabilities. And New Zealand want to protect the amount of liability that they have to pay in dollars. Uh, so their demand is actually for demand of uh, dollar forwards uh, instead of demand for New Zealand dollar forwards. The second proposition is that the magnitude of a FX swap basis uh, increases in the magnitude of external imbalance, uh, as well as the hedge ratio and the cost of financial intermediation. So during times of financial distress, hedge ratio goes up, cost of financial intermediation goes up. Country's external imbalance actually is relatively persistent, typically speaking. Uh, so it's really these factors are harder to capture, uh, harder to measure uh, from the traditional standpoint that drives exchange rate market movements and FX swap movement. And that's where the disconnect between the traditional exchange rate movement and uh, macro variables lie. And the third proposition is that holding currency demand from all other sectors of the economy fixed, an increase in the hedge ratio uh, impacts the country's spot exchange rate in proportion to this external imbalance. And so this is talking about a spillover of the forward demand translating into 
translating into demand for smart exchange rate as the invest as the intermediaries uh, need to manufacture and uh, produce the forward contracts by also trading in the spot exchange rate market so that they're on that not exposed to exchange rate movements. So now let me jump into some conclusions on the swap line based on the model. So previous literature have shown that uh, swap lines are effective at reducing currency basis. In this paper, we really focus on uh, explaining the heterogeneity, the cross-sectional distribution of who use the swap lines the most and why do they do so. Our finding is that you know, positive external imbalance countries, um, both theoretically and empirically, end up using more uh, of the swap line as they are uh, related to the increase in currency hedging needs by the investors in dollar assets. So the data and measurement is relatively standard. Standard uh, exchange rate from Bloomberg and FX swap basis is calculated as just the forward to spot differential adjusted for interest rate differential. These are all in logs. Uh, measures of external imbalance is from the IMF uh, net international investment position, as well as uh, subtracting the equity component, just looking at the net debt plus foreign direct investment component. And this is because equity are less likely to be hedged. And this is also a theoretical result from some previous paper by Campbell and co-authors. So in our paper, we actually confirmed this, that equity imbalances indeed do not explain exchange rate dynamics as much as uh, debt and foreign direct investment uh, exposures. So going to uh, some just plot of uh, how these FX swap basis look like, again, FX swap basis measures the forward uh, valuation relative to the spot valuation or the cost of dollar loan relative to uh, the risk-free interest rate. Um, so of course we had this large uh, global financial crisis where everything blew up in terms of the FX swap funding cost. Uh, but since then it has been persistently wide, uh, mostly due to regulatory changes that limit uh, bank dealer balance sheet. In a more recent period that we're seeing again, uh, this is ending actually at the peak of the crisis uh, around March and April, uh, these uh, various spaces blew up again in different currencies. What we want to emphasize is this heterogeneity. Not all of the currencies are going in the same direction and they vary in the degree to which uh, the FX swap basis has changed. So you can see that a set of countries, uh, this is probably a better uh, graph looking at the average FX swap basis during this time period. What you find is that the more positive external uh, positions implied more negative uh, FX or cross-currency basis. So that's again related to this intuition that you know for a country like Japan or Switzerland, the investor there demand to have their local currency in the forward market to hedge for the eventual payoff of their dollar investments. As a result, their local currencies or the yen forwards are overvalued uh, relative to the spot exchange rate versus uh, the set of deficit countries in which the is not the net investor, but the net borrowers uh, are the ones that are marginally demanding in the forward market and they demand to have uh, the dollar in the forward. So it's their local currency end up being undervalued in the forward space relative to uh, the spot exchange rate. So let me move into the COVID-19 case study. Uh, so in this, paper, we discuss a couple of different case studies, as well as have a general framework of evaluating using a factor model of uh, how uh, hedging behavior affect uh, various markets. But the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was actually the initial financial turmoil. It was quite a shock and perhaps creates a good environment to study this. What we find is that the movements in the forward and spot exchange rate are very consistent with hedging demand going up. Um, until the Fed started cutting rates and um, doing various type of interventions, which were effective, and the markets quickly normalized uh, amid the announcement of various Fed facilities. The several important takeaway lessons from this period is that the demand for dollar is not uniform. In fact, it's a little bit counterintuitive that there were more demand observed from surplus or surplus investment countries in dollar rather than deficit countries. And there is relatively more use of longer term swap facilities uh, 
So the three-month facilities that we put up, rather than the one-week facility, uh, than the previous crisis, that is within the price, uh, GFC period, as well as the Euro area that uh, crisis earlier in 2011, 2012. And lastly, the swap land draws were reflecting both funding demand by uh, bank financials, uh, which was similar to before, as well as this hedging demand by non-bank financials, uh, such as say pension funds and insurers uh, that just had uh, quite a bit of dollar assets and they want to hedge the exposure. Similarly to uh, on the liability side, it could be uh, institutions that are not short of debt that they want to uh, hedge dollar exposure uh, on their liability side of the balance sheet. So looking at the FX swap basis uh, during the COVID, again, I end this sample uh, around the time when the Fed started inter uh, intervening, so around March 15, uh, during that week, there was quite a bit of intervention. And I will show you later what happened afterwards. But again, you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, dispersion and we find mostly an overvaluation forwards for uh, countries like Japan and you know, Canada and Europe uh, versus New Zealand and Australia. And there's different degrees spread out. So looking at it through a cross-sectional perspective, it is the deficit countries that sell their forward currency become more undervalued and the surplus countries that sell their forwards become more overvalued this is a conditional statement of the change rather than the earlier graph I showed about the average, which signals that during times of financial uh, strains, uh, more hedging demand creates a demand for dollar forwards for deficit countries uh, as they want to hedge against uh, increase perhaps that liability uh, due to exchange rate movements. But for surplus countries, it's the other way around. Uh, because the surplus countries are invested in dollar assets, they're demanding more for their domestic currency forwards uh, so that they could be paid off uh, in their domestic currency later on when the investment um, matures. So the changes in the forward versus spot relationship also carries over in the spot exchange rate by itself. And generally, we think this is uh, reflects partly a spillover from the forward to the spot exchange rate market. Uh, of course, there are many other factors affecting the spot exchange rate as well. Uh, it could be that there is also just forced selling of assets uh, during these time periods. Uh, but overall, the general conclusion, conclusion from other literature is there is a macro disconnect that we don't observe as much of the movement in the selling or buying of um, assets at a macro level. So there has to be more financial adjustments. Now, moving on to the swap line. So this is uh, what I discussed earlier, alluded to earlier, that both among the permanent swap line uh, counterparties and the temporary swap line counterparties, the countries that had the largest positive net investment positions were the ones that drew on the swap line the most. So among the permanent members, it was Japan, and there's not so many data points, but you can see that you know Europe drew quite a bit. Uh, Switzerland, much less, but there's a general positive trend, but perhaps it's a stronger among temporary swap line members that Korea and Singapore and Norway countries that have positive net dollar investment were the ones that invest, uh, drew on the swap line a lot more than countries that had deficits such as Brazil, Mexico, and Australia. So this is taken from uh, our financial stability report some of my colleagues put up. Um, looking at the overall time trend of the three month FX swap basis uh, during comparing the previous GFC period and during the COVID period. And this is zooming into uh, the more recent period. You can see that there were many announcements during this period. This is just a subset of them. Uh, many of the domestic credit facilities also helped to tame uh, the dollar shortage. Um, but we do observe that there were quite significant impact after these announcements, uh, including the FEMA repo facility, which I don't have time to talk about. So the broader takeaway and picture of this uh, paper is also just connecting the currency return to macro fundamentals. Uh, so previous papers have looked at various types of risk, consumption risk, currency crash risk, and uh, financial intermediaries. What we propose is this hedging channel that uh, 
precisely spells out why some currencies depreciate while others appreciate in quote unquote bad times and produce these type of risk premium that could explain the average currency access return as well as the conditional access return. Um, so this is related to that discussion of risk premium that the hedging channel explains the average currency risk premium, the average return uh, based on uh, what we understand about the crash risk that are created through this hedging demand. And perhaps this hedging demand is behavioral in that investors shouldn't be you know, increasing their hedge ratio during only financial stressful times, rather they should hold it constant. But given that they do this type of uh, behavior, uh, we observe that the uh, currency risk premium is very much aligned with the hedging demand channel. In the paper, we have a lot of more additional results around um, using a factor model to formally find the dynamics of um, forward and spot exchange rate and how they generally uh, appeal to this framework as well as uh, results on the currency option prices looking at risk reversals and the term structure of FX swap basis. Uh, so I encourage uh, those interested to look into the paper further. But let me just conclude that this paper we uh, explore this new concept of currency hedging of large institutions uh, being an important driver of exchange rate markets. And in particular, there are large drivers of the difference between forward and spot, uh, that is the FX swap price adjusted for interest rate differential. And they also explain the usage of central bank swap line uh, by various different counterparties. And uh, this is uh, probably one of, the central bank swap lines are probably one of uh, the most important facilities uh, due to its size and usage. Um, and we think this sheds light into uh, why central bank swap lines uh, were used uh, by quite a large range of institutions and uh, were used in such great volume. So thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Gordon. It was a very interesting presentation. It kind of <laughs> flow, flows nicely from the conclusion from ours uh, as well. So. Uh, really nice giving that detail. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'll unmute them. Just state your affiliation, and if you want, turn on your camera so we can uh, we can interact. Uh, any questions? Uh, Andreas. Yeah. So you ignore me. Uh, so as this. Um, I guess, you know, the question is, so you have a model and I wonder what the source of markets distress in your model is. Is it sort of shocks to balance sheet capacity of dealers? Is it just FX volatility? And does it matter for the effect of the swap line? Because, for example, this time around, say, the commercial paper market dried up in the US. And I guess a lot of foreign, foreign investors had to rely on local funding. Via the swap. So does it matter where the stress happens? And can you speak to this? Yeah. So in our model, which I didn't really go over in, in due to time, uh, we mainly focus on the demand side. That is the currency volatility driving the investor demand, which in turn uh, affects the demand on swaps and forwards. Of course, during times of financial stress, we also observe that balance sheet constraints also are greatly affected. Uh, so that's part of the model that we uh, do not model as much because, uh, in part, there were many other papers that uh, discuss this intermediary channel, this uh, the supply side being more tight. So we focus on mainly the demand side and the behavior with the uh, exchange rate volatility. Okay, okay. So basically, the shock being an exogenous shock to hedging demand. Is that how I can understand your model? Yes, uh, exogenous shock to hedging demand, but this exogenous shock we do endogenize in a way uh, by attributing to investor behavior that they just, for whatever the reason, they end up hedging more of their uh, currency exposure during times of financial market volatility, which of course is sensible from a normal person, like everyday perspective. Uh, but you know, from a traditional um, asset pricing angle, maybe, the, that maybe that is a behavioral bias that it should be just constantly having the same hedge ratio rather than have these time varying hedge ratio that actually kind of goes against them because you want to hedge when 
the market is not volatile, so you could be prepared for the times when market are volatile. If markets are already volatile and you hedge, then you're kind of losing out on the uh, uh, on the hedge uh, because it's almost too late at that point. You had another question, Andreas, or was that the other question? Yeah, no, no, I have another question. So, so I, but that's that's. So, to what extent does this hedging demand potentially explain the change in the correlation between sort of U.S. dollar and and and, and currencies? As far as I remember, is that the, the you know as far as I remember the the, the 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 correlations kind of are sort of conditional on macro macro circumstances, and and does that does that account for? I mean, I guess you allude to this in the conclusion, but. Yeah, so, you know, in our model, we assume that it was a one single hedge ratio that could go up and down um, for our countries. But of course, if you have a larger imbalance, either positive or negative, then you are hedging more or less as a ratio of your total uh, amount of imbalance outstanding and in that direction. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true. It could be that some investors just end up hedging more or having a higher level. Uh, focusing on the change, it does appear to be generally true that you know, for one reason or another, investors uh, tend to hedge more during times of volatility. And that could be uh, universally true across the countries. I have another question if there isn't. Let me... I, I have a question, of course. <laughs> So have you looked at the, so everything is US versus the rest, I guess? Yeah. Have you, have you looked at the second biggest exposure if the US is the biggest one in terms of responsiveness of the risk premium? So I can see if the second one is relatively very big relative to the rest that maybe they can work against one another and the premium is not as responsive. Yeah, so we did look into that. So there's actually two ways of thinking about this. One is uh, because dollar is such a dominant currency for uh, trade and investment, uh, then studying the effect of dollar really matters in capturing uh, exchange rate market movements. The second uh, aspect is if we try to map triangularly, you know, how much Japanese investors are invested in Euro, um, how much are they hedging their Euro exposure and vice versa, uh, I think the result is actually you could uh, triangulate in that the differences in the exchange rate between, say, the euro yen uh, versus the dollar could be mapped to the euro yen uh, bilateral exchange rate directly. Uh, so, relative to each other, um, it, there is an additional factor of you know, how much each country has their non dollar exposure, but overall, um, the general broad summary is that uh, you could map it into a single uh, factor exposure to the dollar. Andreas, you want to go? Yeah, just just one one. I mean, that was more a comment. Miss- um, the the. I mean, would it be natural to normalize the swap line demand by sort of not size of the country? Because I mean, for example, I mean, some some were at quite huge. You know, dollar demands in your, in your correlation graphs, but really, would it be, make sense to normalize these demands by something, say US dollar denominated assets? Uh, or, or yeah. Not? So, depending on how we measure it, because the swap line itself uh, is based on uh, a dollar, it is a dollar amount. So, when we uh, looked at the amount of imbalances, we also had to compare the absolute value. Now, we could normalize both the x and y axis. Uh, to a GDP, um, but that would result in the same effect. Uh, But here we're looking at the uh, gross amount of dollar uh, swap demand versus the gross amount of uh, external imbalance. Uh, But we could certainly normalize it. And we've done that um, before as well. And that results in very similar uh, type of pattern. Yeah, I'm not thinking GDP. I would more think sort of how many US dollar denominated assets are held by sort of nationals in that, in that country. That would be the more natural. Mm. That's, what, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So uh, we have these very gross measures of uh, imbalances that capture, but that tries to capture exactly how much dollar uh, are 
uh, investments occur. Of course, not all gross imbalance, these are at the country level. That doesn't mean that the bilateral dollar uh, exposure is as much, but that's a uh, measurement issue that we hope to improve on. Thank you. Am I missing out on any questions? No one's raising a hand. Okay, Gordon, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I think we'll open up the floor to anyone uh, having any questions about any of these papers, I guess. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll head to John for some final remarks. Uh, so do I see a question there? Let's see, unmute. Cheng Gao, is that correct? Was that an applause? Oh, that was an applause apparently. Uh, okay, okay. Um, I guess it's difficult, more difficult to have a, a discussion on uh, with, so with everyone un, with everyone muted and then trying to unmute everyone individually. Uh, so maybe a thing to do is to maybe give some final remarks in relation to other people's papers. Uh, so I can see very easily how our uh, risk, our study of the risk neutral densities uh, and the strong effect in the, in the swap lines kind of fits nicely into uh, Gordon's uh, paper where we don't provide as much uh, detail in terms of the accounts and exposures, uh, something we can learn from for sure. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I, th I think what, what we did very nicely here is that I think we, we started with a paper analyzing actually the COVID cases and the impact on asset prices. And then we basically look at uh, decomposing the asset price move movements in uh, risk premia and then basically looking at the Fed reactions and how kind of going, going forward on moving forward from uh, Daniel's uh, presentation and looking at the uncertainties. So I think it all fits very nicely into, uh, there seems to be a nice, nice thread through all the presentations, which I liked a lot. Uh, the one where the one ended, the other one kind of took over, which, uh, which I like a lot. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so in, in that sense, I think it's it's all very complementary, uh, all these papers together, uh, and uh, I, I for sure learned a lot from uh, from how from all the different perspectives and how they kind of feed into one another. I don't think we have many uh, results that contradict one another's papers, which uh, which is also really nice to see. Um, I would say, Andreas uh, <laughs> gave you a weird look, I guess. No, so the contradictions were then not necessarily not, not bad thing, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not the bad thing if you do slightly different stuff. If you do exactly the same stuff, having contradiction is uh, it's a little bit worrisome, I would say. Uh, yeah. Uh, so certainly from the Bank of Canada, we have uh, we have looked at this very closely, and especially in the department where me and Andreas are uh, are at. Uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of questions, which hopefully we can answer with some of these papers. Um, so, so I think adding on to uh, what you mentioned, the removal of tail risk, as you. Uh, uh, documented. Uh, that's just crucially important in the decision making process. And one aspect of it uh, that's visible and that's uh, in the thinking of the various facilities is uh, looking at the FEMA repo facility. That one we intentionally uh, priced it out of uh, out of the money. That is, you know, it was priced at or as plus fifty basis points, which is much. Uh, higher than uh, the private or just the general repo market where it's trading. And yet, you know, we did receive uh, quite a bit of comment from market participants that uh, that is still a very helpful facility uh, in part because it removes this tail risk that there will be a need uh, to draw on uh, such facility. It removes the tail risk that there could be a fire sale of US treasury, even though we don't think that's uh, likely the scenario, but we did see, you know, in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, onset of the uh, of the turmoil, there were some selling of treasuries by uh, foreign official accounts, and uh, we wanted to prevent a uh, a tail risk of 
larger amount of uh, selling by these uh, type of foreign institutions, even though you know the, the pricing was not the most favorable. Uh, but many of these facilities, as uh, Daniel also uh, mentioned, are meant as uh, backstops. Uh, they, they're not meant as standing facilities that are being used every day. And in fact, the Fed doesn't want to do that, right? With the interest rate policy uh, being a in a floor system uh, rather than a quarter system where, where we closely manage the everyday uh, movements in the short-term funding market, we really wanted these uh, facilities uh, to be drawn up on during times of financial stress, but not being so relied upon that they become a habit of uh, market uh, to constantly utilize them. I think I think this also I think that's something that also came up a couple of times is the signaling aspect of actions. So one one way you can see the swap lines is a commitment of the Federal Reserve to to support the international system, and that by itself might have a strong signaling effect. On, in the, you can think of it as eliminating these tail risks, but it's uh, in the same way that you know one thing that comes out. Of, I mean, vaguely comes out of our study is that macroprudential actions seem to have mostly had negative signaling effects, and that's maybe not too surprising because you know if you if you tell banks that they can go down to the capital buffers, the market might have feel things are very bad. And I think that also speaks to Daniel's sort of. Um, I think you also talked about these signaling effects um, potentially being there. So I think so uh, in terms of signaling. That's maybe an interesting channel to look at. You know, to what extent you know certain actions had positive signaling aspects or information, positive information and negative information in in, in them by themselves. I guess if there's no further questions, uh, maybe John can uh, can close off the conference and. Uh... I think some people can have dinner and some people can have lunch. Uh, <laughs> John, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lerpy. And it does indeed fall to me to bring this conference to a close. Now, one of the positive externalities of COVID-19 is that it's so much easier to put together an event like this. It would have been nigh on impossible to get all these four excellent speakers in the same room if all we had was an old school analog conferences. So I do certainly thank the speakers for having not flown to London, but at least connected to Zoom to give their presentations. Mattia, Lucas, uh, Lerpe and Andreas did an excellent job at putting this together and the Bank of Canada for supporting us. But a special thanks is due to Oana and Anne, our most excellent administrative team that make it all look so seamless, even though I know it's such a hard work. Even when you have these di modern digital conferences, they're still very hard to put together, perhaps not as hard, hard as the old school analog ones. So they certainly deserve a special things. I would ask you to clap your hands, but it's rather pointless sort of today, but I'll, 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 do, I'll do my best. Lerby? No, he's not clapping. And with that, I bid you goodbye and stay safe. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, bye -bye. Thank you all for the wonderful comments and conference. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.